Hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to our tutorial on privacy in web ad advertising, uh, analytics and modeling. Uh, this tutorial will be given by me and the second half will be given by my colleague here, Buddy. So without further ado, let's uh, get started. Today we will be discussing uh, the privacy concerns in web advertising and how uh, how we are developing the tools to tackling them. And the tutorial is divided into two parts. So in the first part, we will go over the basics of the privacy concern, the, including the privacy attacks, and some basic tools, including differential privacy, and uh, the analytic tasks that you can do with differential privacy and the uh, APIs that are out there. And then in the second part, we will discuss more about modeling and learning and prediction tasks. So before we jump right into the privacy aspect, let's uh, recall some terminologies in online advertising. Uh, I'm sure most of you already know the terminologies, but just uh, to recall to make sure everyone is on the same page. Uh, there are several entities that we will be interested in. One is the advertiser. So of course the advertiser is the one who pays to show their ads, right? So this could be a website or an app that pays to show their ads. The publisher is the website that actually shows the ad. And finally, we also have the ad tech. So the ad tech is a, a, an entity or a platform that help the advertiser and publisher uh, uh, buy and sell the ads, okay? This includes uh, Google ads or Facebook ads and so on. So I will not discuss too much the ad tech uh, today. So we'll be focusing mostly on advertiser and publisher. And there are two types of events that we'll be interested in. Uh, the first one is uh, impression. Impression is an event that uh, a user interacts with an ad. So this could be a view event or a click event. And we also have a conversion. A conversion is an action that a user makes that the advertiser considers to be valuable. The most basic example is a purchase of goods or services, but it could also be other things like installing an app or interacting with an app in a certain way as well. Okay, so that's just to recall very basic terminology. So now, <clears throat> just to give a basic example, let's say you own a toaster company and uh, you have a domain toasters.example, then you go and uh, pay oiweb.publisher1.com to show some ads, uh, maybe some banner ads, and in some other page, maybe you show some video ad and banner ad and so on. And after a user see this ad, they go to your website and buy a toaster. In this case, you as, a, as the toaster company is the advertiser, uh, the website that show your ads, the publisher1.com is the publisher. Uh, each ad that is shown to the user is considered an impression. Oh, sorry, I need to show this somewhere. And uh, okay, maybe I should disable this. Okay, and the uh, action of user buying the toaster is the conversion. All right, so with those examples in mind, let's talk, let's now talk about privacy. So we'll start with the most basic setting, okay? So let's say that you have some sensitive uh, ad data set. So this data set contains some ad, uh, some information about conversion or uh, impression of uh, end users. You run some algorithm on it, maybe it's an analytics algorithms or it's a learning algorithm to train some model and you get out some output. Maybe it's some statistics or some ML models. And then the question that we want to answer is, is this algorithm privacy preserving in the sense of, can you safely use the output in the downstream task 
without the risk of leaking the user's sensitive data. And to answer this, it is uh, easier to answer the opposite question. When is the algorithm not privacy preserving? And this leads us to the privacy attacks. In the first uh, and most basic privacy attack is called reconstruction attack. So this is a scenario where an adversary who gets a handle at the output can do some post-processing of this output and get back the individual user's data. So obviously this is not privacy preserving because an adversary seeing the output uh, can get the sensitive data of the user without any protection. To see this example in action, let's think about, uh, again, a very simplified setting of query answering system. So let's say uh, you have a system where uh, someone like an analyst can provide a query, and then you will give out the answer to this query. Is this a safe uh, system privacy wise? Let's consider an example data set where um, let's say it's an, uh, a conversion data set that counts the number of conversion per user. So here we have say four users and the last column counts the number of conversion and the first three columns are uh, each individual's data. And for simplicity, we will only consider a setting where you can only do sum and count uh, queries. And also we assume that only the last column is sensitive. Uh, so this is a pretty reasonable assumption if, for example, the, uh, the adversary is the publisher because the publisher shows the ad. So the publisher already knows the user and also their, their demographic. The only thing that they don't know, uh, the publisher doesn't know, is whether the user converts and by how many times or by how much. Okay, so in this setting, suppose that uh, we, we allow this query into this data set, how can we reconstruct it? Okay, so as you can imagine, it's not that hard if the adversary uh, can select the query. If the adversary can select the query, then they can just say, you know, select some of the number of conversion where um, name is equal to a certain user, right? In this way, they will get back exactly the number of conversion. They do it again and again for all the user and they can reconstruct the entire sensitive column without any noise at all. Okay, so this is obviously a bad scenario and we want to protect, uh, protect against this. So, so traditionally, there are a few uh, ways of protection that people have proposed. Uh, one, of which, one of which is uh, k-anonymity. So in k-anonymity, what you do is that you reject all the queries if it involves less than k individual or k users, right? In our setting here, if the query uh, asks for name equals to Bob only, then this query involves exactly one user. So if we set k greater than one, let's say k equals to three, then this uh, will be rejected. Okay, so there will be no answer, it will just be a reject. So so, so far this uh, k anonymity, it sounds good, but if you think about it a little bit more, you will see that there is actually a lot of vulnerability. One issue with it is the so-called differencing attack. And here we can try uh, something like this. So we can first query for the sum of uh, the number of total number of conversion for everyone but Bob, right? In this case, it still involves three users. So you get an answer back. And then we do the uh, total number of conversion for everyone. So we get this answer back. We subtract. So we, get, we now get the number of conversions of Bob, right? We do this again and again for all the user Again, we can reconstruct the entire data set. So as you can see, k-anonymity is kind of nice for one query, but when you talk about multiple query, it doesn't compose very well. And uh, this is one of the points of differential privacy. As we will see in a moment, differential privacy is a notion that compose well and is more robust uh, to, to post-processing as well. And the other type of mitigation is to add noise, okay? So instead of outputting the correct value exactly, uh, you add some noise to the answer, right? Noise it a little bit. 
And this is exactly an approach that is taken by differential privacy. And we will see in a moment how this ensure differential privacy and uh, formal privacy guarantees. Okay, so in the previous setting, uh, I was saying that the adversary can select the queries, right? That's why they can select query only Bob or like everyone but Bob and things like that. But how about if the adversary cannot select the query? What if the third party select the query or what if the queries has to be set beforehand before the system is run? Okay. In this case, it turns out that you can still do some pretty good reconstruction attack. Not always, it depends on exactly the, the queries that, uh, that are there. But you can view it as a system of equations uh, because you can think of the last column as the unknowns. And each of the query will give you one equality. Like for example, the first query is the sum of the first and the last row. So you get one equality here. And then you do it again and again. And now if, you, if it's not degenerate, then you can solve uh, exactly uh, all the last column. So even in this setting, sometimes the adversary can reconstruct the entire sensitive data. Okay. And even with noise addition, uh, they can still do something. In particular, you know that the sum is roughly equal. So you can set up some optimization problem instead of equality. You can try to minimize certain loss function. Let's say you can minimize the square loss or the L1 loss, whatever uh, you like the most. And you get back some, uh, some answer. Now, of course, since there is noise, you wouldn't get back exactly the unnoise, uh, the, the raw data. You get some noise data. But as you can see here, if the noise is relatively small, sometimes you still get a pretty accurate result. So it's also important that you add a large enough amount of noise. And we will see this uh, in the formalization of differential privacy. OK, so those are the attacks against a uh, query answering system, which is kind of perhaps the most basic setting. But another setting I want to quickly mention, but not go over in too much detail, is, is the in the anonymization of the data set. So previously, we have uh, a data set. We have an algorithm and a query, and we want to answer that query. But what if instead of answering query, you want to output another data set that is somewhat useful for some downstream task? OK, but you want this data set to be somewhat private or somewhat anonymized. Can you do it? And, and of course, if you output the raw data set, then it's not private because it contains all the information. But there are techniques out there that people use to make anonymized data set. And two of the most popular techniques are suppression and generalization. So suppression is when you completely delete uh, the data of those uh, rows. For example, uh, you can censor out the names completely. So this column is completely suppressed. Generalization is when you replace a value by, by something that is more general, but you don't completely delete it. For example, you can bucket the age into different age group. Like here, I'm doing greater than or equals to 40 and less than 40. So this is an example of suppression and generalization. Now, as you can see here, the data set on the right now sounds, now looks somewhat more anonymized, right? There is no name and, you know, there is uh, some, for each zip code, there are multiple people and so on. So the question is, uh, is it privacy preserving? It turns out that it's still pretty hard to say in this setting, and you have to be very, very careful. Like uh, in this particular example that I show you, it is uh, vulnerable to the uh, so-called de-anonymization or linkage attack. Uh, and in the linkage attack, the setting is, is that the adversary has some auxiliary data set. So in this case, again, you can think of the last column, the number of conversion as being the sensitive data, but the rest is known by the adversary, similar to the previous setting. And now you have the anonymized data set and you want to link the two. In this case, it turns out that it's still pretty easy because if you look at the zip code and the age, then you can see that the first row can only match to the first row there, the second row to the second row there, and so on and so forth. So you can recover the entire data set directly. So that's, that's uh, 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 yeah. That's something you have to be careful about when you anonymize the data set. And, and this technique is uh, can be generalized pretty well. So even if you try to anonymize more, like I delete the edge here. Now, now in the second column, there are 
a couple of possible meshes here, but you can still construct this compatibility graph and do a maximum meshing. And you will see that there is still only one possible meshing here. So you can still reconstruct uh, the data set. Okay, so it's, uh, yeah, you have to be very careful when using separation and generalization. And this is not just a, an academic uh, uh, exercise either, but there have been real life uh, leakage due to linkage attack. Um, there are a few high profile cases uh, I, that I want to give as example. One is uh, the Massachusetts health data. For some reason, uh, the state at that time, I think this is in the 90s, thought that is a good idea to uh, share the, the employee health data, but with the personal identification removed. So they removed the name and, and they removed the like uh, social security numbers. But um, uh, a researcher, uh, Sweeney, managed to identify many people, including the governor's medical record, uh, using the linkage attack similar to the one that I showed earlier. Uh, another high profile example is the Netflix price, like you might have uh, known it. So in this case, uh, the data set is anonymized user rating. So you have a movie rating and the time that the rating was given, uh, but with the user ID uh, re-randomized. Uh, it turns out that it, uh, this can also be de-randomized, uh, sorry, can be de-anonymized using the linkage attack, like similar to the one before, uh, by looking at public information from IMDB uh, website and other source. Okay, and another example, more recent example is edX data set. So there is, again, uh, an ed edX data set that is anonymized using uh, k-anonymity. And in this case, using uh, linkage, uh, sorry, using LinkedIn, uh, data, uh, LinkedIn data as an auxiliary data, some, a few students are identified. Here is not everyone is identified, it's only a few, but still. Uh, that's not very good. Okay, so uh, so um, yeah, I want to quickly mention that k anonymity can also be used in the uh, data anonymization setting. Uh, I will not go into too much detail, but roughly speaking, uh, what you do is you want to make sure that in the if you look at the column of the public data or the known data there is at, at least K repetition for everything that occurs. Uh, for example, in this setting, after you suppress, uh, the known data only contains zip code and each zip code has at least two users that share the same zip code. So here you can say that it's uh, too anonymous. Uh, and yeah, and if you just look at this, then it, if you have no additional knowledge, then it means that you cannot distinguish uh, each user from K minus one other user. So you cannot identify an individual user in this setting. But it turns out that um, there are a lot of vulnerability. And one of them is, uh, is something similar to differencing attack before. Uh, if you release two anonymized data set using k-anonymity, it's possible to do a differencing style attack and get a linkage back. Okay, So it lacks this uh, composability that we want. All right, so that's uh, that's the uh, privacy uh, attacks that we have talked about. So, so far, we have given a few examples of privacy violations, right? But let's think about it uh, again in the opposite set, in the opposite direction. What about uh, what is not a privacy violation? So one thing that is very important when thinking about individual privacy is that inference is not privacy violation. Okay, so let me give you an example just to make this a little bit more clear. So let's say you have a, you have some data set that is collected, let's say this year, uh, that contains individuals and their smoking habits and maybe also some other information like their age and whether they have uh, a cancer, let's say. And this last column, whether they have a cancer is the sensitive uh, sen is the sensitive column, okay? So you have this data set, whereas uh, the other columns, let's, let's consider them public. Now, as many of you know, there have, there have been many studies since the 50s that heavy smoking cause uh, increased uh, risk of cancer. Now, if you go and even adversary 
go and look at the public uh, part of this data set, then they can see that Bob is a heavy smoker. Then um, they can predict that Bob might have a cancer. And let's say that th this prediction is true, right? This inference is true, let's say. Does this mean that the study from the 50s violate Bob's privacy? Obviously, this is not the case, right? Because this was a study from the 50s. The Bob wasn't even there in the data set, right? So this clearly doesn't violate Bob's privacy. But yeah, and this is an important point that uh, since the study doesn't involve Bob data at all, it shouldn't be considered a privacy violation for Bob. Okay. So if you train a model and a model can predict something very well, it doesn't mean that that's a privacy violation. In other words, privacy and utility are, are not on the opposite angle. Okay, they can work together as long as you are identifying a pattern, a large pattern in the data, not individual users pattern. Okay, this is a very important point. And uh, given the previous point, uh, when we think about a good privacy measure, we should think about the case where uh, we run the algorithm on the data set that doesn't contain that user's data. Let's say there is a user A that we are interested in protecting the privacy. And we consider the two cases where user A is not in the data and user A is in the data and run the algorithm. We know that on the left, user A is not in the data. So we should consider this to be privacy preserving because we didn't even use the data of user A at all. Whereas on the, on the right, we are not sure because we use the data of user A, but maybe our algorithm uh, does some anonymization that protect user A data. So a good way to uh, measure whether the right-hand side is privacy preserving is to compare it to the left-hand side, because we know that on the left-hand side, user A is not there, not privacy preserving. So if we measure it somehow and it's, it's uh, somewhat close, then it sh the right-hand side also shouldn't be privacy preserving. Okay, and this will also be the uh, the angle taken by differential privacy. Okay, so next we will uh, talk about the definition of differential privacy and its properties. Uh, before before we start that, are there any questions so far? Okay, if not, then let's uh, start differential privacy. So before I go into the for more definition, let's uh, let's start by high level uh, reasons why differential privacy is very useful and has been very popular. Uh, so one is that differential privacy is very robust uh, against uh, differencing attack uh, against composition and post processing. It provides a mathematically rigorous guarantee on the protection of individual users' data. And at the same time, as we discussed in the inference versus privacy violation, it still allow uh, the algorithm to learn pattern that emerged in large scale that doesn't violate individuals' data. And thus, it can still give a very high utility for many uh, useful tasks. Sorry, I should have asked my question. No worry. Um, based upon your um, thinking around inference not being the same as privacy, uh, is that to differentiate it from different attacks that we can go off? You mind expanding that a little bit without getting a hint at all these steps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um so this one is is a little bit uh different than yeah, it is a little bit different than in, in than inference attack. Uh but um yeah, but I would say that it's is more about uh if you have a prior knowledge, uh, sometimes you can already tell what the sensitive data should be with very high uh, confidence. And that prior knowledge may not be related to privacy at all. Yeah. So I guess here, your uh, clarification is that um, we need to consider whether the individual is in the data set or not. That yes. Is the key that you're trying to highlight. Yes. So yes.
Yeah, and the um, yeah, another thing I want to say about uh, differential privacy is that many of the known uh, security privacy techniques like MPC or federated learning are also sometimes uh, vulnerable to the attacks that I had talked about. And uh, only when you combine it with technique like differential privacy or some other anonymization technique, then it becomes, then it gives uh, uh, formal privacy guarantees. So even in, in conjunction of other anonymization technique, differential privacy can still be very useful too. Uh, finally, you know, as many of you might have uh, heard, uh, privacy research is is uh, is a is a big topic, and a large part of that is DP. There are a lot of uh, academy, uh, a lot of work in academia on this, and also there is a lot of uh, work in in practice as well, both uh, on the public and on the private sectors. Uh, one of the most exciting one is the US Census Bureau. They, the 2020 US Census release is released with differential privacy guarantees. Uh, similarly, as, as we will discuss a little bit more, uh, with, there are new APIs in web advertising that are employing differential privacy. Uh, so this is a very popular notion. And, uh, and as you will see, uh, it is a very nice notion and hopefully we can use it more. All right, so with that like very high level point in mind, let's uh, let's go back to this slide. So as we said earlier, uh, we we want to compare these two settings, right? Where a user is there in the data set versus a user is not there in the data set. So in differential privacy, uh, we require that the algorithm is a randomized algorithm. And what we want is that if you run the algorithm on these two settings, the output distributions are similar, okay? We, we, we'll see in a moment what, what similar or like almost the same here means. Okay, so just to recall the intuition, if you add or remove a single user to the data set, the output distribution of the algorithm should remain roughly the same, okay? So here is the formal definition. The formal definition is parameterized by two privacy parameter, epsilon and delta. And it says that if you run your algorithm M on a data set X and another neighboring data set X prime, then the probabil probability that any event occur on the output when you run it on X, this is the left-hand side, is at most E to the epsilon of the same quantity when you run it on X prime plus delta, okay? So the epsilon here is like the multiplicative allowance of of the uh, increase in, in the probability and the delta is the additive allowance. As you might have already noticed, the smaller epsilon and delta, the better uh, the guarantee. If you set epsilon and delta both equal to zero, then it says that the probability has to be exactly the same. So it means that your algorithm cannot look at the input at all, cannot depend on the input at all. So that's great in terms of privacy, right? If your algorithm doesn't look at the input at all, but of course it's poor in terms of utility. Meanwhile, if you set epsilon to be infinity or if you set delta to be one, then this condition will always be satisfied. So every algorithm out there satisfy uh, epsilon zero dp or zero one dp. So that is a trivial guarantee. It doesn't guarantee any non-trivial privacy, okay? So in practice, you wanna strike uh, uh, the right balance of setting the epsilon and delta such that you can still get a good privacy guarantee while also still get some utility out of it. And in general, uh, like a common practice is to set epsilon to be some small constant, like between 0.1 and 1 is a good practice. Sometimes, especially in web advertising, they set it larger, <laughs> like, you know, 16 and more. But uh, you know, ideally, you would want it to be small constant. Uh, delta, uh, 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 as we'll see in a moment, delta you want to set it to be negligible to the number of users, so much larger than, much smaller than one over the number of users. When delta is zero, uh, we just write epsilon dp just for short, and we refer to this case is PLDP. Uh, when delta is greater than zero, we refer to it as approximate dp. And uh, yeah, I want to stress that 
epsilon delta dp is a property of an algorithm, right? So an algorithm can be epsilon delta dp. Is epsilon dp epsilon delta dp is not an algorithm. There could be many algorithms that satisfy epsilon delta dp, as we are going to see in a moment. And uh, epsilon and delta, we will sometimes refer to them as privacy budget. OK, uh, any questions about the definition? Yes. I mean, there have to be technical in terms of the number of users, but number of users really is like the, the number larger than one. Like yes. So oh, yes, yes. Sorry, is negligible in number of users meaning much less than one over number of users? Uh, so yeah. you have like, you know, 10 million users, maybe you set it to 10 to the minus 9 or 10 to the minus 10. Any additional questions? Okay, if not, then let me say one thing, which is the I haven't really specified this word, right? Neighboring. In the intuition, we say that we are gonna compare the case where a user A is there and another uh, and the case where the user is not there. So that's that's the most uh, basic notion of neighboring. X and X prime are neighbor if it results from adding or removing a user from the other data set. But you can do a lot more with the neighboring notions. Uh, for example, neighboring notion can encode user level versus event level privacy. If your data set uh, contains, uh, let's say, the all the conversions for, yeah, uh, yeah, contains all the conversion, let's say, and you use user level DP where X and X prime are neighbor if they differ on a single user. Then you can go from x to x prime by deleting one user, which may contain more than one record, if that user converts more than once. Right? Uh, similarly, you could be considering event level DP, where instead of consider a, an entire user, you consider adding or removing a single conversion. Right. So in this case, you wouldn't delete both of them; you would just delete the last one. Yeah. Sorry, the highlight is wrong. You're just deleting the last one. Okay, so you can encode this how fine grained you want to protect your privacy. Of course, since user level is uh, contains more data points when uh, is more flexible when you move from one to the other, it will provide better protection compared to event level differential privacy. Similarly, another difference is that uh, what we discussed so far have been add remove DP. So you go from one data set to the other when you add a user or add a row or remove a user or remove a, a row. But another popular notion is substitution DP. This is when you keep the number of rows the same, but you change the content in the in the rows. Okay. Uh, substitution DP is sometimes easier to deal with. So in this talk, I will be focusing on substitution DP from now on, but they are mostly interchangeable. We, we are going to see later on that add remove dp also implies substitution dp with a small loss in in privacy parameter but they are mostly interchangeable but it's easier to do substitution so we will do substitution okay so those are the neighboring notion uh another note is about pure versus approximate dp again pure dp is when delta is zero approximate is delta greater than zero so pure dp is nicer of course because the constraint is more strict uh, but it gives a uh, worse privacy utility guarantee. Sometimes allowing delta even very, very tiny can uh, make your algorithm much, much better. And also uh, in terms of composability, we'll see in a moment, it gives a worse composability. Approximate DP uh, has its own weakness in the sense that it allows for what people sometimes call catastrophic event of privacy. For example, Consider an algorithm that with probability delta release the entire data set without any noise at all. And with probability one minus delta, it does nothing. The output now or something like that. So this algorithm is zero delta dp. But of course, that with that probability delta, you leak all the user's data, right? And that's why it's called the catastrophic event uh, here. And the point is that approximate dp allow for this catastrophic event. That's why you want to set the delta to be very small. 
another example of this catastrophic event is if you randomly select one user in your data set and you uh, and you release that user's data without any noise. So in this case, you get delta to be one over n if you follow the definition where n is the number of users. And this is the reason why you want to make sure you set delta to be much less than one over n to prevent, uh, to prevent such a mechanism to be there. But even though so far it sounds pretty bleak, I, I want to say that in practice, the algorithm that I use in practice that satisfy epsilon delta dp, they don't have this catastrophic event. So there is no, there is no, you know, small probability that every, like uh, every record is going to be leaked, right? So in practice it degrades very, very gracefully, uh, typically, but it's something to keep in mind when people set the value of delta. Okay. So with that in mind, let's talk about why we like differential privacy. So we like differential privacy because there are many nice properties about it. First of all, when you run an algorithm on your data set and you get some output, of course you want to use that output for downstream tasks, right? This, uh, this uh, output may be some ML model or maybe some analytics and you wanna use them in, you wanna use them in downstream tasks uh, to make business decision or, and so on and so forth. Differential privacy allow you to do that, okay? So if you have a result of a DP algorithm, you can use it in arbitrary manner and it remains DP. Okay. More formally, if your mechanism M is epsilon delta DP, then if you apply any function, a post-processing function H on it, the compose, the compose like H M mechanism remain epsilon delta DP. Okay. Uh, so that's great. So you can use it with downstream tasks without worrying at all about leaking the original data set. The next one is composition. So this is, uh, if you remember, this is the setting that we talked about before in terms of K anonymity, where if you, if you use K anonymity and you allow multiple queries, then, uh, then you can reconstruct the data set. Okay, this is not the case for differential privacy. So let's say you have a multiple queries and you add noise to all of them uh, such that each of them satisfy certain differential privacy parameter. Uh, you can view this uh, in a slightly more abstract manner as uh, the algorithm having multiple subroutine, each subroutine for each query. And for query one, it satisfy epsilon one delta one dp, epsilon two delta two dp, and so on and so forth. So in abstractly, you can think of it as, as uh, instead of having one giant algorithm, you have many subroutine that is epsilon one delta one dp, epsilon two delta two dp, and so on and so forth. And it turns out that if you run this algorithm with this multiple subroutine, the final output still remains dp, okay? So you wouldn't completely leak any one data, but the privacy parameter will be worse. So this helps a lot uh, when you design algorithm because you don't have to analyze a gigantic algorithm every time. You can just analyze each piece of your algorithm and they fit together very nicely. There are multiple composition theorems with different parameters. The most basic one is the basic composition theorem. It just says that you can sum up the epsilon and sum up the delta. Okay, so in this case, the uh, the the combined output is epsilon one plus epsilon two to epsilon k and delta one plus delta two to delta k dp. Okay, so this is a very basic, right? Now this is nice, but as you can see, the epsilon grows quite quickly. So if all your algorithms have the same privacy parameter, the epsilon will grow by a factor of k. And it turns out that uh, this you can do better by the so-called advanced composition theorem. So yeah, uh, the, the exact theorem is a little bit mouthful, but the point is that the epsilon only, only grows with roughly square root k instead of k, but you have to pay a little bit in terms of the delta. There is this like delta prime term that you have to pay. And this is what I said earlier about uh, uh, the composition degrading more gracefully for approximate dp because you can apply advanced composition theorem, whereas in pure dp, you are only left with uh, basic composition if you want to apply a composition. Okay. And there are, there are more 
there are many more advanced techniques for composition and privacy accounting, which I will not go into, but is a very active area of, of research. Um, another interesting property is parallel composition. So if you have your data set, you run the algorithm on it, but instead of running the algorithm on the entire data set, you run K algorithm on this joint part of the data set. Okay, so you partition the data set into K parts. The first part, you run the first algorithm, second part, the second algorithm, and so on and so forth. Then if each algorithm satisfies epsilon delta dp, then the combined output also satisfies epsilon delta dp. Okay, so you don't lose anything at all. You don't have to com you don't have to apply composition theorem as before, right? If you apply composition theorem as before, your epsilon or delta will grow. So here you don't have to do that. Another property is group privacy. So group privacy is very useful when uh when each user can contribute multiple times in your data set and there is no clear way to detect it. Uh, for example, let's say you have this uh uh, uh purchase data set, a uh, conversion data set, and you run some epsilon dp algorithm, but later it turns out that the first two rows are from the same individual. Maybe they have multiple email addresses. Does this still provide DP for this individual? So it turns out that the answer in this particular case is that yes, it is still two epsilon DP for this individual. So privacy degrades very gracefully when you have multiple records in the data set. Um, yeah, the exact formulation is a little bit mouthful, but uh, if you can change from one data set to the other by at most k move in the neighboring notion, then your epsilon goes up by a factor of k, and your delta goes up by another factor that is slightly larger than k. Okay, so so uh yeah, if you have a epsilon dp algorithm, uh you run it and later you discover that some user contribute k times more than they should have it still remain k epsilon dp. So the privacy protection is there. It's not as good as you had intended, but it's not completely gone. Another example here is uh, add remove versus substitution, which I alluded to earlier. So if you think about it, um, you can mimic uh, a substitution move by two add remove, right? First, you remove that record, and then you add it back. Okay, so now you can, you can apply uh, group privacy here. And you can conclude that if a mechanism is epsilon dp for add remove notion, is two epsilon dp for substitution notion. Okay, so group privacy is very useful also to relate these different notions of privacy. Also, including event versus user level privacy, if you know that each user contributes only a certain number of events. All right, the last one is amplification by subsampling. So if you think about it, it's intuitive, right? Suppose you have a data set. You don't run your algorithm on the entire data set, but first you subsample the data set, only a small portion of the data set, and you run the algorithm on that small portion. It's intuitive that this process should make it more private, right? Because you know most of the time, each user is not even going to be in the subsample data set, right? So in that case, it's completely private. And in, sub in the other case, you run the algorithm on the end. That is it. And you can formalize this. Um, so just to recall, uh, you start with a data set and you and you subsample the data set somehow, which I will specify in a moment, and you run the epsilon delta dp algorithm and you get the output. Uh, then you should get a better guarantee than epsilon delta. Okay. So one possible sample is to sample b out of n uh, user randomly without replacement. So you just select B user out of the end user randomly without replacement. So if you do this with a uh, substitution DP, then you get that the combined algorithm, this entire subsample mechanism is epsilon prime delta prime DP, where epsilon prime and delta prime goes down by a factor of roughly B over N. Again, the exact expression is a little bit mouthful, but it goes down by roughly the sampling factor, the B over N. Okay. And, uh, this is for substitution DP. For add remove DP, you can do a similar thing, but now instead of doing uh, sampling without replacement with fixed batch size, now you do Poisson subsampling. So you include each user with probability P 
and then you get a similar guarantee. So epsilon and delta will goes down by probably a factor of t. Okay. So this is really great. Like if you have a very large data set, and somehow in your anal in your analysis you don't you don't want to look at the entire data set. Maybe it's too large anyway, and you are gonna look at a small portion anyway, or or maybe uh uh yeah or, or maybe a small portion is already accurate enough, right? Then this is a this is a great way of amplifying amplifying differential privacy. Like uh, the plot on the right uh, show the epsilon, the x-axis is epsilon before amplification and y-axis is after amplification. Uh, as you can see, it gives you a lot of amplification like by roughly a factor of uh, the subsampling rate with some constant in there. Okay, so that's amplification by subsampling. Uh, yeah, before I go to the next section, are there any questions about the properties of differential privacy? Yes. Uh, so you mentioned there are property Yes. Uh, I wonder who is responsible to apply this and who is the like potential attacker? Yeah, so both both could be uh, potential attackers and um Yeah, I guess both could also be 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 <laughs> applying. Uh, I I would say is yeah, I I would say more both right, but more but more of the publisher. I would say the publisher is is the one that is more likely to be attacker. Or... Yeah, more likely to be to be the attacker. Yes, because the the publisher they have uh they have all the attributes of the user. And they want to determine whether they want to show an ad or not. So they want to train, say, train a model uh, to determine this. Uh, but we want to make sure to keep the conversion private because the publisher doesn't know the conversion. So the ad like by prevent the publisher from Yes, yes. I think. Yes, I think that's true. Yep. But do you want to? Yeah, well, I think I mean, I think it's a thousand. And, and, and then, uh, right. yeah. so some third party. Yeah, oh. it could be the web browser. Okay. I'm just seeing the cross side of the cross side. Right. Yeah, so I think we will have a specific example later on. So may maybe that the browser thing will be clarified. Okay, any additional questions about the about this before we continue? Okay, then then I will I will briefly discuss about uh about some basic mechanism just to give you a flavor of what you do to satisfy uh, differential privacy because so far we only discussed about definition and its property, but not the algorithm, right? What exactly do you do to satisfy differential privacy? And the most basic mechanism is the noise addition mechanism. So let's say you uh, you have a data set X, you want to compute some function on it, GX, right? The easiest thing to make it private is to add some random noise to it. Now, of course, uh, the main question is, how do you add a random noise such that it satisfies epsilon or epsilon delta dp? And the the rough intuition is, of course, you want to add the noise enough so that it hides the contribution of a single user, because you want to make sure that the output distribution remains roughly similar when you add or remove a single user. So, so the exact noise will then depend on the range of the function and also how sensitive the function is, right? When you add or remove a user, how much does, does the value of the function change? So these are the main, the two main factors that will determine the noise distribution. And we will see an example in a moment. So the most basic mechanism here that I will show is the so-called discrete Laplace mechanism. Uh, sorry, the title is uh, hidden. So the assumption here is that the range of t is integer. So t is integer value. And we define the sensitivity to be the maximum change when you go from x to x prime, neighboring x and x prime. So in other words, if you do add remove, if you add or remove a user, how much does your function change? How, how, what is the maximum that your function value can change? Okay, so as discussed earlier, we want to add noise 
to hide a user contribution. So if the sensitivity is higher, we have to add more noise. Uh, just to give a quick example, if we do some count query, right, so some count and uh, some condition, then the sensitivity is one because if you add or remove a user, then the count will change by at most one. Okay. If you do a sum query on on some uh, on on some attributes, then uh, you have to be a little bit careful uh, because if that attribute if that column is not bounded then the sensitivity can be infinite, right? If the conversion can change from 60 to a million, right? Then the sensitivity would be close to a million. But if you know that the that column is somehow bounded by C, then you also know that the sensitivity is at most C. Right? Uh, the same thing go with uh, average query, right? Uh, if you have the same assumption, then the average query will have sensitivity C over N, okay? So that's how you determine the sensitivity. Now the discrete Laplace distribution, uh, now the discrete Laplace mechanism adds the discrete Laplace distribution noise. And the discrete Laplace distribution is a distribution that uh, that is supported on integer. Uh, and this is the is probability mass. So it peaks at the middle and then it goes down geometrically as you go to the left and to the right further away from the origin. Okay, so the exact expression is there is uh, exponential minus i, uh, absolute value of i over b, where b is the parameter. And the uh, mechanism is very simple. So what you do is uh, you sample a discrete Laplace noise with parameter that is the sensitivity divided by epsilon. You just add it to the output of, of the function that you want. Okay, and that's your entire mechanism. Everything else is the same, just add, add, add one noise term to it. Okay. Um, yeah, just to give you an example, if, if, you are, if your function uh, value is three, then the output will have highest probability at three, right? And then smaller at two and four and so on and so forth. And this mechanism uh, is pretty simple to show that uh, this, uh, this satisfy epsilon dp. So this is kind of the most basic uh, epsilon dp mechanism. And uh, yeah, I will not show the proof here, but it's pretty simple to follow. And the illustration is, is like this, like if you have, uh, if you run the mechanism on one input, uh, so on one input X and you change to an input X prime, it's like shifting a distribution. And since you know that the probability mass of the consecutive value doesn't change by more than E to the epsilon, then you know that it's epsilon DP. Okay, so I will not go into the proof, but it's fairly simple to, to, to work out. Okay, so that's like the most basic. Uh, that's that's the most basic uh, mechanism. And how how about the utility, right? So far, we only talk about adding noise, but um, is this a good or is is this too much noise that we don't get any meaningful signal out of it? Now there are multiple utility measure. Uh, today we will just talk about uh, mean square error and root mean square error here. And for this uh, discrete Laplace mechanism. Uh, yeah, you can compute exactly the mean square error of the noise, but the point here is that the mean square error is only uh, delta, delta is the sensitivity divided by epsilon square. Okay, so in other words, the absolute error is only the sensitivity divided by epsilon. Okay, so this is great because the noise is constant regardless of how big your data set is. Okay, as long as your sensitivity is constant, your epsilon is constant, like if your sensitivity is one, your epsilon is 0.01, then the noise will be of the order of the hundred, right? So if your data set is a million, this is a very tiny amount of noise. So you get a lot of utility out of it. Yes, and this is for one dimension, right? If your value of t, uh, the range of t is integer or t is integer value, it's very simple to extend to multi-dimensional setting. Uh, you you need an appropriate notion of sensitivity. So in uh, multi-dimensional setting, you look at you look at the difference between the two vectors and you take the LP norm. In the case of uh, in the case of in the case of the Laplace mechanism, you you take the L one norm. And uh, if you think about uh, queries such as a histogram query, so if you change 
move a uh, change a, a single user, then a single user just move from one bucket to another bucket. So then only two buckets are changed, and each change is at most one. So in total, the L1 sensitivity is at most two. So this is uh, one example of the discrete Laplace mechanism in the multi-dimensional setting. And that's it. That's what you do. So you do exactly the same thing as before. So you add discrete Laplace noise to each dimension independently, except that now you use the L1 sensitivity because now you're in high dimension. And each coordinate, you just add the noise independently. Okay, so the so the extension from one dimension to multi-dimension is relatively uh, easy. Is, is that uh, clear or any are there any questions? Okay, so that's the that's a multi-dimensional discrete Laplace. Uh, of course, as I said earlier, we require that the the uh, range of the function is integer here. As you might have noticed, this is necessary for discrete Laplace because discrete Laplace now is integer value. So if you try to apply it on real value function, it wouldn't protect the user data because uh, let's say if your gx is 0.1 and gx prime is 0.2, then the noise doesn't change the uh, the number after the decimal digit. So you can tell exactly whether you are from x or from x prime. So this discrete Laplace noise doesn't work. So if you want a noise that work for real value function, you use uh, Laplace noise instead. Laplace noise is essentially the continuous version of uh, discrete Laplace. So the now you are now since it's a continuous distribution, we are talking about probability density function. And the probability density function here looks very much the same as before. So it's maxed out at the middle and it geometrically uh, goes down as you go further away from the origin. Okay. And what you do is exactly the same as before. So instead of adding discrete Laplace noise, you add Laplace noise, but with the scale parameter that is the same, the delta, the sensitivity over epsilon. This mechanism is epsilon dp. Again, we'll not go over the proof, but you know you can uh, you can try to figure it out. This is a relatively simple and you know, pictorially it's kind of clear. Uh, the yeah, the mean square error again is very similar. It's order of delta over epsilon square. So even in the continuous case, you still get that property that the noise is constant if your sensitivity is constant and epsilon is constant. Uh, again. Extending to multi-dimension, you can do it, just change sensitivity to L1 sensitivity and add noise independently. Sorry, could you just clarify the G of X? Oh, sorry, uh, G of X can be any function that you want to compute. Yeah, so G of X could be could be those sum query, the cow query, average query, or it could be the histogram query. Yeah. So in this case, um, we are looking at the um, previous scenario. Right, right. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I I didn't clarify that very, very clearly. This is uh this is very much a, like a yeah a query scenario where you wanna compute a function that is numerical. Yeah, that, that that's a very good question. This noise addition mechanism are of course only for numerical uh numerical value um outputs, not, not for other type of outputs. A any additional questions, comments? Okay. Okay, so, so that, that's the Laplace mechanism. So the last noise distribution I want to mention, which will be mentioned later on, is the Gaussian distribution. So if you add the Gaussian distribution, you do not get epsilon dp anymore. Now you get epsilon delta dp. So you only get approximate dp, not pure dp. And um, the the formula, which is a little bit hidden here, is uh, where can I move? Yeah, it's, it, it is a little bit mouthful, but again, the noise scale with one over epsilon, but since now you have the delta, there is also dependency on delta and dependency is roughly root log one over delta. But this is not too important, but it's just another noise that is uh, very popular.
Uh, yeah, one advantage of the Laplace, uh, sorry, of the Gaussian noise is that when you go to the D-dimension version of Gaussian noise, you can look at the L2 sensitivity instead of L1 sensitivity. And the L2 norm of a vector can be much smaller than the L1 norm. So in certain scenario, um, uh, the Laplace noise will result in much less noise compared to the Laplace uh, the sorry, the Gaussian mechanism will result in much less noise compared to Laplace mechanism in high dimension. Okay, so Gaussian can be very useful in high dimensions. Yes, and this is a uh, again the high dimension setting of like you have a bunch of vectors and you know that you know that the L two norm of the vector is bounded, and and you want to sum them up. So in this is a kind of a the most prototypical example of how you how to apply the Gaussian mechanism. If you know that L, the L2 norm bound is at most C, then you know the sensitivity is at most 2C because if you change one vector, the worst is you flip it, right? So you can apply the Gaussian mechanism uh, using the L2 sensitivity here. All right, so those are the noise addition uh, mechanisms. Uh, now, what we have uh, studied so far is a setting where we have an entire data set X, right? We have an algorithm, we run on it and we get some output. So this is a setting that people call central DP because the analyzer or the algorithm get to see the raw data, the entire raw data set, okay? And, and this is okay in a setting where you have the entire data set in some database that you own. But when you are talking about distributed analytics, this might not be desirable or when there is no trusted uh, central authority to do this computation, this might not be uh, desirable, okay? So now we will consider this distributed analytics and then consider other trait models, other different models of differential privacy that are more suitable to this kind of setting. So in distributed analytics, uh, we will simplify it so that each user i has an input xi, then from this input, the user I produce some message YI. The message is sent to the analyzer or the algorithm. And then the algorithm compute the estimate of some function that you want to know. Okay. So in the central model that we consider so far, the guarantee is only on the final estimate. Okay. We only know that the final estimate is epsilon delta dp, but we don't know anything about the message that are exchanged in between. Another popular model is the so-called local model. So the local model requires that each message yi is epsilon delta dp. Okay, so this is much more desirable. If you think about each user holding a device like a phone or something, then this means that everything leaving the user device is already differentially private. Okay, and by post-processing, this means that no matter uh, what is done on this piece of data that leave the user device the epsilon delta dp is still guaranteed. So the user doesn't have to trust any external party to do the noising for them. They noise it themselves and they get the dp guarantee already. So this is very desirable in the distributed setting. So we will, we will just look at some example and some basic mechanism again in, in the distributed setting. And we will uh, talk about counting since it's the easiest problem. So in counting each xi is zero, one. Like maybe it is uh, correspond to whether the user is reached by, by an ad or not. And we want to count the number of users that are reached. So it's just the sum of all the xi. Okay. In the central mechanism that we saw before, the way this would have been done is that each user send a message that is exactly the input, the raw input to the analyzer. The analyzer take the sum and then add to it some noise. Let's say Laplace noise or discrete Laplace noise, it doesn't matter. So we'll get epsilon delta, uh, sorry, we'll get epsilon dp and get very small error. Like remember that the error here does not depend on the number of user, right? The root mean square error is only one over epsilon, regardless of how many user we have. So this is great in terms of the error, but as we discussed earlier in terms of trust is not good. So how about the local DP? So what can we do? The easiest mechanism is that each user just noise their own data themselves, right? Instead of asking the central authority to add the Laplace noise, they just add it themselves, OK? 
Okay, so instead of sending xi, they send xi plus ci, where ci is the Laplace. And now the analyzer just take the sum. So clearly this is epsilon uh, local dp uh, because each user already add the noise. But how about the mean square error, right? Or, or the root mean square error. So the error now becomes quite large, right? Because the final sum has the error term that is the sum of the n, uh, the n, the n error term. But but as you can easily see, since all the since all the CIs are independent, uh, the variance is just the sum of all the variance. So at the end, what you get is that the root mean square error is roughly root n over epsilon. Okay. So now it is not independent of the number of users anymore, and it becomes much larger by a factor of root n. But it is still useful because root n is still much smaller than n. Okay. So if you have like a million users, your error would still be like a thousand if your epsilon is roughly one. So that root n will show us up a lot in local DP, and it is known that this root n is necessary. So if you want this uh, better trust guarantee, this root n is the price you have to pay uh, to get this guarantee in, in terms of privacy. Okay, so that's that's one uh, one mechanism. Another really popular mechanism that should be mentioned is the randomized response mechanism. So as its name suggests, uh, randomized response just random just re-random x with certain probability so instead of sending xi directly with a certain probability you send you flip it and send that flip value instead and if you work out the probability it's something like this and you get epsilon dp and and again uh yeah i, I will not do all the calculations here but if you use the right estimator the unbiased estimator uh, you get that the the uh, root mean square error is also in the order of root n over epsilon as well. If you look at the exact constant, it's actually smaller than the Laplace mechanism. So the randomized response is better for counting than the Laplace mechanism. Okay, I'll, I'll not go into the details. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Finally, for the local DP. Uh, Algorithm, I, I just want to quickly mention the, the histogram problem. So in the histogram problem, uh, you each xi is a bucket, and you want to build a histogram uh, based on these buckets. Uh, the way you do it is you can, you can uh, adapt the randomized response as follows. So you encode each uh, input x as a one-hot encoding. So let's say if you have three buckets, uh, and x equals to two, the one hot encoding will set will will be a string of length three, and it will be zero everywhere except one at the bucket is contribute to. So in this case, it will be zero, one, zero because x is two. Then you apply the randomized response to each bit of this encoding, and you get back the this randomized bit. And this is the entire algorithm. So you you send this to the analyzer. And so the analyzer can use it each bit to compute the estimate. Uh, of the histogram. And uh, if you set the parameter correctly, this satisfies epsilon dp. And uh, again, the uh, mean square error is, oh yeah, this uh, yeah is root n over epsilon, uh, similar to before. Okay. All right, so those are all the uh, local dp algorithm I want to discuss. Uh, next, I want to also mention that there are other models as well. Uh, we will not go into any details in this talk, but I just wanna, uh, uh, flash this model and uh, so that uh, when you when you hear it you you know what it is so this is central model and the local model we discussed um, there is another model called shuffle model where when you send the messages instead of the messages being sent directly to the analyzer there is another party in the middle that shuffle all the messages this party is sometimes called a shuffler and your requirement is now that the shuffle messages is uh, is dp or in other words, the multi-set of messages is DP. Uh, this model has many names, and the main advantage here is that there is a kind of an epsilon, uh, sorry, amplification by shuffling like a privacy for free here, in the sense that if you run an epsilon 
local DP algorithm, then it will become epsilon prime delta shuffle DP algorithm, where epsilon prime is much smaller than epsilon. I mean, for a reasonable value of delta. It's not too important what it exactly is, but, but the point is that when you get too high among all the other messages, uh, you become much more private compared to in the local setting where you, there is nothing too high. It's uh, your message and your message alone. Okay, so that's the shuffle model. And yeah, it turns out that you can design the, uh, so you, you, can, you can apply the standard uh, randomized response in shuffle model and by amplification, by, by shuffling that I just said earlier, you already get smaller amount of noise, but you can even design the algorithm specifically for this model that gets noise that is almost the same as the central DP noise. Um, another model that we will not go into detail, but it's also very popular is the uh, ZKL multi-party computation. So here, instead of all the user talking to uh, a single analyzer, there can be multiple helper servers and the user can talk to one or multiple helper server. And this helper server can also communicate between themselves and they will produce uh, the final result to the analyst. Um, now, uh, as some of you already know, like if you use a technique from cryptographic literature, you can use this, uh, this model to compute any function as accurate as, as central DP. But uh, what is so nice, not, not so nice about it is that uh, it's not very efficient. So sometimes, uh, sometimes you want a, a more efficient algorithm maybe at the price of uh, slightly less formal guarantee. And uh, this uh, bring me to the next model. Uh, sorry for the header is uh, gone again. Uh, so this is uh, the trusted uh, execution environments or TEEs. So in this setting, there is only one party. So there are no communication and it's much more efficient. And the memory is encrypted. And it's only decrypt when it reads by the processor. But of course, the processor still gets to see the raw data. So the protection that we get here, uh, yeah, so, so we get a much better efficiency. But the protection on the processor here comes from the hardware instead and from the attestation of the code that the code that is run on the processor is actually the code that we want and not something that, uh, that has been hijacked. And uh, some cloud providers now offer these TEEs and is more efficient than MPC. So some of the privacy preserving uh, ads uh, servers are using these TEEs. Okay, so those are all the uh, differential privacy models that I want to mention. Now I will talk about the DP ads analytics. Um, so what, what are the kind of analytics we want in ads, right? The most basic thing is perhaps reach, the number of users that see our ads. Um, related to reach is frequency. So K frequency is the fraction of the number of users that see the ads K times. And also there is a, at least K frequency, uh, which is the, the same, but uh, the number of user, the fraction of user that will the ad at least k times, right? Um, yeah, this is probably very familiar to many of you. But just as an example, if you have four user, one of them see the ad once, two of them see the ad twice, then the reach is three. The k frequency histogram is one third, two thirds zero. The at least k frequency is histogram is a third one one. So this is one of the most basic uh, basic um, statistics you want to measure when you run an ad campaign. Um, and of course, you want to reach for the entire ad campaigns, but sometimes you also want to slice it further. Maybe you want to reach based on geographic region, like uh, people in Massachusetts, California, and so on. And maybe you want to slice further based on demos, like their age, and so on and so forth. So typically, um, this query will form a hierarchy, hierarchy of queries. So you have a query at the top that is for the entire campaigns. And then the next layer that is sliced based on the geography. And the next layer that is sliced further based on the demo and so on and so forth. 
and uh, we will discuss more about this hierarchical query later on. Now I want to go back to this uh, this online advertising uh, example where uh, just to recall the user see three ads right before uh, the user converts. Now, now these three ads may not equally contribute to the decision of the user to convert or to buy the toaster. And this is why ad attribution exists. Ad attribution try to assign credit based on uh, which, which one is more important, which impression is more important to this uh, conversion. Okay. And uh, yeah, just to give some example, uh, many of you probably already know this. There is last touch, last, last touch attribution, which is assign all the credits to the last uh, to the last ad that the user interact with. There is of course first touch attribution, which assign all the credit to the first ad. There is uniform distribution, uniform attribution, which is equally among all the ads. And uh, when more than one impression gets uh, gets credit is called multi-touch attribution. Um, there are other type of rule like it, it can decay by time. Uh, there, there might also be prioritization and the one that has the most priority gets all the credits. And, uh, and more recently, uh, ML models have also been used in ad attribution. So you might train a model that try to assign the credits to all these ads. Okay, and uh, yeah, for simplicity, for the rest of this talk, it will be single touch attribution. And, but I want to highlight that um, this attribution can involve multiple publisher. So the attribution can be run when, even when the user see the ad on multiple publisher, right? So it may not be just on publisher one website only. So what are the kind of things that you want to learn from ad attribution. Um, so you want to learn uh, things like conversion rate, uh, like the number of views or clicks that leads to the conversion. Or you want to learn the average conversion value based on the ad attribution. And similar to before, sometimes you wanna slice, uh, slice this query instead of asking it for the entire ad campaign, you wanna slice it based on demo or based on geography. And uh, it can be hierarchical in nature as well. Um, Again, this is uh, an example like attributed conversion value for the entire campaign and then based on states and then based on states and, and um, demos. Sometimes you may also want to learn event level statistics, right? For each particular ad you show, does it lead to a conversion and what's the total conversion value? Uh, but you talk more about that. So I will skip this second part for now. Um, and these uh, ad attribution queries uh, are very important query because this result can lead to uh, important business decision. Um, for example, if the conversion rate is too high or too low, maybe you increase or decrease the ad budget. You can also use this data to build model to predict conversion rate, which is uh, then used in the bidding procedure. So, so with this uh, query in mind, let's talk about uh, private measurements. So there are multiple uh, there are multiple points for which that could be privacy leakage in the process of uh, measurements of ad measurements. First of all, there is the output, right? As we discussed before, uh, the output statistic or the output models uh, those could leak the user data, but as importantly, the intermediate tools that we use uh, can also leak user data. Uh, and one of them is third-party cookies. Um, and it should be noted, uh, and we discussed this a little bit earlier, that ad measurement is aligned with privacy, okay? They are not on the opposite end or, or they're not in conflict with each other. Because in ad measurement, we also want to learn pattern uh, of the ads across a large number of users and not tailor specific to any particular individual. And the same thing holds for privacy guarantee as well. So third-party cookie is a, a tool that has traditionally been used for 
uh, for ads attribution. But uh, as we will mention uh, very quickly, uh, it is very, it allows uh, for multiple vector for tracking users. So not very good for privacy. And there is a large effort in removing third-party cookies. But since uh, we have been using third-party cookie for ad attribution, we now need some new tools for doing ad attribution. And the proposed tool should be more privacy preserving. And there have been many and many tools uh, that have been proposed in the different browser for this, uh, for this purpose. Um, yeah, and I, I list a few of them here. Uh, most of them, again, are with DP, but some of them like private click measurement in Safari is not with DP, it's a, more like a information leakage uh, limiting. Um, so so there, there is a, there is a uh, working group that are considering all these proposal. And if you, if you are interested in learning more, uh, you, you can go to this thing. I, I'm gonna share the slide afterwards. So of course we are talking about differential privacy so far. So our focus will be this uh, proposal with DP and we will discuss some of these next. Okay. So, <clears throat> sorry, just to quickly remind you, uh, in, in third-party cookie world, the way things work is that when you when you see a banner ad of uh, of toaster.example on the publisher, you get a third-party cookie from the toaster uh, or the advertiser. And then this third-party cookie will be sent uh, the next time you see the ad and it will be updated and so on and so forth. So this is great because it allows you to determine exactly the impression that the user have seen so far and before convert. Um, so it creates for reason and frequency measurement and also specifically for ad attribution as well. But it's also terrible in terms of privacy because if you are a bad, a bad actor, you can really track the user across different websites. In this case, you would know that the user goes to publisher one and then publisher two and then publisher one and so on. Okay, so this is why the third party cookie is uh, phased out. But of course, the main challenge is now that we don't have third party cookie, how do we do this uh, ad attribution? And, uh, and now I, I will give you a high level overview of the API for private ads attribution. Uh, and this is the so-called aggregate API. Uh, it's proposed, at, uh, it is running in some percentage in Google Chrome. So the key thing is that instead of using third-party cookie, we will record the impressions and conversion data on the browser, okay? and the attribution logic will be run on the browser. So the attribution logic is run on the browser and your uh, browsing history is not linked, okay? So for example, uh, if this user uh, or in this browser has a sequence of impression and conversion, this sequence of conversion and impression is not seen uh, outside of the browser. Instead, after some specified amount of time, uh, an attribution logic will be run on this uh, on this attribution data set. And once you run it, you get the pairs of impression and uh, the, the pair of conversion and attributed impression. And then um, the ad tech can specify how they want to report this. And the way they specify it is they can write some script that turns this attribution data set into a histogram contribution. So they can define the buckets and how this is turned into the contribution. This contribution will then be collected across all the browsers and the aggregator will then sum them up and output the total contribution. Okay. And at the end, the advertiser or the ad tech will only get to see this aggregated histogram and not the individual contributors, uh, not the individual contributions. Okay, so that's a very high level, uh, that's a very high level overview of the aggregate API. 
Uh, the aggregator itself is um, not like completely set in stone, but there are multiple proposals, in, including using some multi-party computation or trusted uh, environments, as I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier. Um, just to give you an example of how one would go about using this aggregate API, let's say we use the same example. We want to compute the total conversion value in hierarchical setting where we have total conversion value for the entire campaign and then by slide by state and then by state and uh and, and demo so in this case you would create one bucket for each query okay so um so here the histogram would have one bucket for the entire campaign this is the leftmost bucket one one histogram for massachusetts and so on and so forth okay now now, when you run the attribution logic, uh, the script can then uh, can then look and see that uh, this browser or, or this impression correspond to a uh, certain state like Massachusetts and age group like 25. So it will contribute to only those corresponding buckets of the histogram. In this case, it will contribute to just the three buckets, the entire campaign bucket, Massachusetts bucket, and Massachusetts and 20 to 30 bucket. Okay, and and this this script on how how uh how the attribution how how the attributed data set is turned into a histogram, the advertiser can specify. Now I want to quickly mention one thing. Like so far, I haven't mentioned anything about uh noising, right? If we just compute the aggregated histogram without any noise, as we saw at the very beginning of the presentation, it wouldn't be private. It wouldn't satisfy DP. So you do have to add noise. Okay. Now, as we also see earlier, adding noise is not enough. You have to make sure that the sensitivity is small. Otherwise, noise will not be enough to hide an individual contribution. And this is exactly why uh, in, uh, uh, in ARA reporting API, uh, there, are, there are two procedures to ensure this. First is that each histogram contribution has to have a, a cap on the L1 sensitivity. So the total contribution across all bucket is uh, uh, can only be at most a certain number that is pre-specified. Currently it's two to the 16, is, but it's not too important. And then at the end, the noise is then added proportional to this uh, to this sensitivity divided by epsilon. Okay, so this then ensures that the the uh, final noisy histogram is epsilon dp. Okay, does this uh, make sense? Any question? Yeah. Uh... We will find the noise scale by the data over the pixel. Uh, just wondering, it's a root. I mean, it looks very interesting, but uh, I don't know if there is any form to say, okay, it's safe or it's like. Yes, yes. So, the, yeah, so I, I didn't go over the proof earlier, but if you set the noise parameter to be delta over epsilon, it's exactly the parameter that gives you epsilon differential privacy. Any additional questions? Okay, I think maybe we should uh, we should take a break and then come back. In, uh, is it thirty minutes? Or? Okay, yeah, uh, let, yeah, let's come back in 30 minutes. Yeah, thank you, everyone. All right, so I think we can get uh, restarted uh, after the break. Uh, so just to recall quickly, uh, before the break, uh, we talk about uh, these uh, on-device uh, attribution APIs. Uh, and this particular one is based on the ARA or attribution reporting API in Chrome, but there are also other proposals that are of similar nature, although the specifics are a little bit different. Uh, the key idea is uh, to do uh, attribution on device or on browser instead of sending the data outside of the browser. And then only 
the final result, which in this case is a histogram contribution, is sent to the aggregator. And uh, before the break, I forgot to mention that these histogram contributions are encrypted when it's sent to the aggregator. And based on the exact technology, uh, maybe it's an MPC. So the aggregator would run an MPC protocol to aggregate all these histogram contribution and add noise. And only the final noisy histogram uh, is reported back to the advertiser or the ad tech. Okay, so that's the that's the recap of uh, what we discussed before the break. And to satisfy differential privacy, uh, in addition to noise, we make sure that we cap the L1 contribution of each user. So each histogram contribution will have an L1 cap uh, of some predetermined number. Uh, so this ensures that the L1 sensitivity is bounded. So when we add noise, we get a formal differential privacy guarantee. Okay, so this is the uh, recap of uh, what the API is uh, before the break. And you can use this to answer queries, but uh, of course you can try to optimize and get uh, better, uh, better, ac better accuracy. Uh, one possibility of optimizing is to assign different privacy budget to different query. For example, in the uh, example that we look at before the break, where we consider the uh, total conversion for, for the entire campaign and then slice by geography and then slice by geography and demo. In this case, you would know that uh, in the first one, the entire campaign has a much larger value. So maybe you can tolerate more error compared to the other queries. So in this case, uh, you can allocate a smaller privacy budget and tolerate more noise. In the uh, attribution reporting API, the way the budget is allocated is based on the scaling of, of the contribution. So in this case, for example, you can rescale the first contribution to be smaller and the last contribution to be larger. So in this, uh, since the noise is still constant, now uh, the relative noise added to the last type, last set of query will be smaller than before compared to the uh, the first one. Uh, now, of course, one have to be careful when do this rescaling because you still have to respect the L1 sensitivity guarantee. So after the scaling, you still have to make sure that you are within the L1 sensitivity cap of like big delta that we look at earlier. Another uh, technique to improve accuracy is post-processing. So the uh, idea of post-processing is, uh, is, is fairly uh, simple. Since these uh, queries are not linearly independent, you can use the linear dependency between them to reduce the error. In particular, for this hierarchical query, you know that the parent's answer is equal to the sum of all its children. Like uh, the total value of, con of conversion across uh, everything is across all campaign is the sum of uh, those sliced by by uh, geography. So you can take linear combination between itself and its children to reduce the error further. So um, with so those are the two examples of ways you can optimize the error when you use this, uh, this aggregate API. But I would say that um, the aggregate API is just a starting point. And I think we need to build a lot more in order to accommodate more advanced uh, reporting uh, and machine learning use cases. So I want to highlight a few challenges. Um, currently, the aggregate API is a pretty basic API that can produce a histogram. And so it's pretty hard to align this uh, with downstream tasks, like um, what exactly is the type of error you want? Like maybe you want a relative error instead of additive error. Currently, it's not uh, very clear um, how to adjust the API to optimize for that. And for the relative error in particular, the DP literature has been focusing a lot more on the additive error. So there isn't too much uh, literature on how to optimize the relative error and also other type of errors. Um, in terms of the optimization, like when you want to set the parameter, like the cap and the scale, um, you also want to look at the historical data because if you scale too large, 
then you have to cap and then you lose a lot of data. Uh, this is also one of the challenge, like what happens if you don't have too much historical data and you, you are in like a cold start situation, um, what, what can you do? There's also a lot of time delay as well, because now you can only produce histogram after a certain period of time. If you produce it too often, then you have to divide the privacy budget and so the noise will be larger. Uh, this is in contrast to the party cookie where it's much more real time. This is unclear how to deal with this. Um, and today I have uh, discussed mainly only noise addition mechanism, but in DP literature, there are many more advanced algorithms like uh, the exponential mechanism, uh, sparse vector technique, and so on. Currently, the aggregate API does not support uh, those algorithms. So it would be interesting to see whether it's possible to come up with uh, APIs that are more flexible and can support this type of algorithm for more advanced use cases. Uh, so that's the uh, uh, aggregation reporting API that I want to talk about. And the last thing in the analytics umbrella that I want to talk about is uh, cross-media measurement. Of course, we are at the web con conference uh, this week. So we care about the web publisher the most, but in real life, um, advertiser run campaign, not only on the web, but also on the other platforms as well. For example, they can run campaign on smart TV and so on and so forth. And now the question is, you want to know the reach and frequency across all these platforms, not just on the web. And this is the question of cross media measurement. So you can think of uh, each platform as having a set of, uh, of unique users and you want to compute the uh, num the reach across all these platforms. Or in other words, you want to compute the cardinality of the union of all these sets. Uh, so there is a project that is going on that is tackling uh, this uh, slightly different angle compared to the previous uh, problem. This is called a Project Hello, and this is led by the WFA, World Federation of Advertisers, which is a consortium of advertisers. Uh, and also like other company, other ad techs, including Google and et cetera. So this, this project is uh, to allow cross-platform uh, measurement of campaigns. Um, the project actually has a pretty large scope. So I will not go into any, any detail except that uh, I will mention that there is a website. You can take a look at it and all the code is open source. And today I just want to highlight the reach and frequency measurement. So. So this project allow you to do reach and frequency measurement across the platform. And the solution is, is something like this, is a, a multi-helper, multi-party uh, computation model where you have multiple helper nodes. Each helper node is run by a different company. So one would be run by World Federation of Advertiser, one would be run by Google, Facebook, and so on and so forth. Now, each, uh, each publisher, in this case, when I say publisher, it also includes non-web publisher, will uh, talk to one of these helper, and the helper will run some MPC and produce the reach and frequency. The privacy guarantee that is uh, given here is that even if all but one of the helpers are compromised, the, uh, the view of the adversary remains differentially private. The solution, again, I will not go into too much detail, is to use some sketching. So each publisher will create a sketch based on their own set. And this sketch is encrypted and sent to the helpers. The helper then uh, take the union of these sketches and then add some noise to it and calculate the reach and frequency based on this noisy sketch. So uh, that's the Project Hello, which is uh, quite different uh, compared to APIs on the browser that we discussed earlier. Yes. Uh, we like to give uh, a simple example of all this batches, looks like. Yeah, um, if you are familiar with Bloom Filter, uh, oh. these sketches are very familiar, similar with Bloom Filter, except that uh, the distribution is not uniform. So it will be exponential distribution. Uh, there is much, uh, there is much larger chance that you fall into first bucket compared to second and third and so on. This help you reduce the sketch size further. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and the merging is now pretty simple, right? It's an R, 
Uh, but for frequency, you have to do a little bit more to detect collision and so on. But for for reach, it, it's fairly simple. Okay, so I think that's uh, more or less all that I have to talk about for the analytics. Uh, are there any questions about the analytics part before I hand over to Buddy for the learning part? Uh, you mentioned that uh, there are uh, like parties that uh, are working on making this attractive, but uh, some of them was the advertisers, some of them was like the W3C, uh, but the fact though is uh, much more the company that decides things like this Google and uh, how do you think it's realistic that what these people are proposing that it will be used to not spray the topic API that is now being put by Google? Uh, or if it's too wide, that's too much. You can also say. Yeah. Yeah, it's a hard question to answer, but I, I would say that in all the projects that we are involved in, including Halo and also the attribution reporting API, right? We we try to make a proposal as public as possible and take uh, feedback and you know work together with everyone uh, to come up with a solution. But but yeah, it, it is not easy to reach like a single solution that everyone is happy, you know, given <laughs> the many stakeholders that, that uh, as you mentioned. But hopefully, I think at least this effort will lead to better and better uh, private measurement. And at some point, I think we will reach that point where we are happy on both privacy and utility. Yeah, sorry if the answer is weak. It's just, I don't know, <laughs> like a more specific answer. I like the direction, but uh, you say that a lot of stakeholders are involved. Is even Google involved? And uh, are they open? No, no, um, the, all these projects are, are, are open, like Project Hello and also the Attribution Reporting API, uh, they are all open, like Attribution Reporting API is, is under Pat CG, right? So there are like meetings and uh, everything is open, all the issues, all the proposal you can read there. Uh, the proposal are also not just from Google, right? The ones that I showed earlier, there are proposals from other as well, like Microsoft, uh, Apple, uh, and so on. So. So yeah, I think every, uh, the process is pretty transparent, but whether we can reach a proposal where it's good both privacy and utility is, uh, you know, is something that, that is an interesting open question. Okay. Yeah, one small thing to add about the previous question is that the topics API is for behavior and targeting, whereas all of these APIs that we're talking about are for measurement. So it's a different advertising use case. And for measurement, as Pazin mentioned, different uh, browsers like Apple, Mozilla, and so on, they have different proposals, but a lot of what Pazin described is also applicable to that proposals as well. For example, differential privacy is considered as one of the main privacy guardrails and the other proposals. There are some differences in terms of privacy units and whether you know MPC is used or TEEs are used, but, but there is also a lot of similarities in these proposals. And Topics API is like totally different categories. Like it's not about ads measurement, it's about targeting, which you know, is, is beyond kind of the scope of this. Tutorial. Um, okay, uh, sounds good. So let me go to that slide. Okay, yeah, so the next remaining part of the tutorial is about private ads modeling. Um, so Pazen talked about analytics and, and ads measurement, the other main category of use cases is related to machine learning and ads modeling, and I'll be covering that part. Um, 
the main use case for ads machine learning models and advertising are for bidding use cases. So here there are a few different models that are commonly trained in these settings. One of them is the PCVR model, where the goal is to predict the probability that an impression will lead to a attributed conversion. Some related models are PCONs, where you know the goal is to predict the number of conversions that are attributed to a given impression. Um, P-value is the use case where we would like to predict uh, the average conversion value that is attributed to an impression. And PCTR is the use case where uh, the goal of the ad tech is to predict whether a certain ad will be clicked or not. So all of these are different tasks and they have uh, related uh, machine learning models that are trained, but ultimately all of them are used as prediction signals that are used as an input to the bidding logic that lets an advertiser decide how much to bid on a given ad in a given auction that is run on the publisher side. And these models are typically quite large in size. They can consist of billions of parameters. And another special thing about them is that they are quite sparse in terms of the number of ones in these data sets. And more precisely, there is usually a very significant class imbalance, which stems from the fact that there are way more ads that are not clicked than there are ads that are clicked, and there are way more ads that don't lead to a conversion than there are ads that lead to a conversion. Um, in terms of utility metrics, one commonly used utility metric is the AUC, or the area under the curve. And we'll be using that in this part of the tutorial and uh, many different uh, evaluations that I will be presenting. And just as a refresher, um, to compute the AUC, one can plot the true positive rate against the false uh, positive rate for a given classifier and compute the area under it. Or alternatively, it is the probability that the classifier ranks a randomly chosen positive example higher than, than it ranks a randomly chosen negative example. And for a trivial classifier that randomly guesses class, the AUC is 0 0.5. For the perfect classifier, it is equal to 1. And throughout this part of the tutorial, I'll be talking about the AUC loss, which is 1 minus the AUC. And more precisely, I'll talk about the relative change in the AUC loss, which is the percentage change of the AUC loss with respect to some baseline. And the baseline will be the model that is trained without any DP uh, guarantees. So in advertising, there are different flavors of DP that turned out to be very relevant. And they depend on the threat model. And specifically, they depend on the viewpoint of the adversary, who is the ad tech training and consuming this model, and that might have access to part of the training data set. Um, so first, let's start with training machine learning models uh, with full uh, differential privacy, which is the most generic notion. So. We have a supervised training data set where um, there is a bunch of labeled examples, XIs and YIs. The XIs are the features of a given example. The YIs are the label. They are fed to some training algorithm that produces a model. And the assumption usually is that every individual has a single labeled example that they contribute to this training data set. And for the, this part, we will be using the substitution notion of DP, and as Pazin mentioned in the first part of the tutorial, um, this notion can uh, be defined by uh, letting you know, one data set X prime differ from its adjacent data set X um, on one training example that is changed to go from X to X prime. And the algorithm uh, that we'll be considering will satisfy epsilon delta DP, so this is the approximate notion of differential privacy. And the canonical uh, version, the canonical uh, ML training algorithm that satisfies full DP is the so-called DPSGD algorithm, which stands for differentially private stochastic gradient descent. So in the next few slides, I'll describe what how DPSGD works, and then I'll talk about how it is applied in the ads modeling context. 
And then in the later part of the tutorial, I'll talk about some relaxed threat models that um, aim to achieve higher utility than the PSGD, but are more realistic threat models in some of the ads modeling use cases. But let's start by recall, recalling the PSGD. So first, let's recall how um, gradient descent works. So uh, non-privately in gradient descent, we have a training data set X. We have um, you know, this data set consisting of labeled examples X, I, Y, I, and we have some empirical loss function, uh, which is can be defined as you know the average over the entire training data set of um, some loss function computed on the ith training example and training objective usually is to mean is to find the weight of the model that minimizes the empirical loss and we can define the gradient uh, by looking at the derivatives of uh, this loss function with respect to each uh, model parameter and in the case of the empirical loss, the gradient can be written as the average over the training data set of the per example gradient for every example in this data set. And gradient descent is just iterating uh, for a, some number of iterations. And then every iteration updates the weights of the model proportionally to the learning rate and to the gradient of the loss function with respect to the model parameters. Um, for the uh, empirical loss uh, that we defined on the previous slide, the gradient decomposes. So it is the average over the training data set of the per example gradient. And we would like to privatize this procedure. And um, one way to do so is to use the Gaussian mechanism, which um, Pazin uh, mentioned earlier in the talk and which proceeds by bounding the L2 sensitivity of the function G and adding some d-dimensional Gaussian noise to every coordinate uh, of, of this function. Uh, so we first compute G of X and then add a d-dimensional Gaussian noise with some standard deviation that depends on the L2 sensitivity of G and the privacy parameters epsilon and delta. So this Gaussian mechanism can be applied to any vector summation primitive. In particular, it can be applied to gradient descent that I defined on the previous slide. So in the case of gradient descent, we can add Gaussian noise to the average of the gradients that are computed in every iteration of gradient descent. However, this is not sufficient to ensure differential privacy because the sensitivity can be unbounded for a given gradient. So the additional step that is needed is to clip the per example gradients in every iteration of the gradient descent procedure. And uh, clipping introduces a bias variance trade-off because if we clip to a very small value, the bias will be large, although the variance will be small. But if we clip to a large value, then the bias will be small, but the variance ends up being large. So there is a parameter C that dictates how much clipping we introduce. And so, with this ingredient in place, we get a procedure that does satisfy DP. Specifically, to analyze the privacy of gradient descent, we can first use the privacy of the Gaussian mechanism. So for every iteration of gradient descent, we have a vector summation primitive that is being applied. And um, we can use the properties of the Gaussian mechanism to argue that this iteration of gradient descent satisfies differential privacy with some parameters, epsilon g, delta g. And we can then apply the same argument in every iteration of gradient descent and then apply the composition uh, theorem of differential privacy, um, either the basic composition or the advanced composition theorem. And this implies that the end-to-end -end algorithm is epsilon delta. DP for some epsilon and delta that depend on epsilon G, delta G, uh, which are the parameters for every for the privacy of every iteration of the algorithm. And they would also depend on T, which is the number of iterations uh, and gradient descent. Um, and yes, uh, previously, like in the previous slide, I was talking about the generic 
vector summation uh, primitive, but it can be directly instantiated for gradient descent, where every term that is being added is the per example gradient and, and gradient descent. Um, so in practice, people don't run the full gradient descent procedure. Instead, they run some variants, such as stochastic gradient descent, where the difference is that in every iteration, instead of computing the gradient for every example in the training data set, we sample a random example from the training data set and only compute the gradient on that example. In fact, in practice, people run mini batch SGD, where we sample a subset of um, size B uh, of training examples and compute the examples only on that batch um, and update the, grade, the, the weights of the model using these uh, examples computed on this batch. Um, and note that mini batch SGD generalizes both uh, gradient descent and uh, stochastic gradient descent. So if the batch size is equal to N, the entire training data set, mini batch SGD is the same as GD. And if the batch size is equal to one, mini batch SGD is the same as SGD. And it turns out that one can analyze DPSGD, uh, which is this DP variant of mini batch SGD, uh, by using pretty much the same tools with privacy amplification by subsampling that Pazin described in the first part of the tutorial. Specifically, we will still add Gaussian noise to every iteration of, uh, of mini batch SGD. And similarly to before, this is not sufficient because the gradient can be very large, but we can fix that by clipping the per example gradient in this batch. Um, and this allows us to get some analysis of the PSGD. Uh, specifically, the analysis can still use the Gaussian mechanism to bound the privacy loss for every iteration by epsilon g delta g. And then it can apply default composition to get an end-to-end -end guarantee on uh, the trained model. But it turns out that one can do better in this case, since one can leverage the fact that every iteration doesn't use all the training examples. It doesn't use all the gradients. Instead, it only uses a randomly chosen subset of gradients. And this randomly chosen subset is not revealed to the adversary that consumes the ultimate model. Um, more precisely, we can use privacy amplification by subsampling. And here to instantiate it, uh, recall that, you know, the out of the data set of size n, only a size b subset is used in a given batch. And um, this allows us to get a privacy parameter for that batch, which is epsilon s delta s, which is on a high level better than epsilon g delta g, which is the privacy of the Gaussian mechanism. How much better epsilon s and delta s are depends on the sampling rate, which is p equals b over n, the batch size divided by the total number of training examples. Um, and pretty much we can use that in every iteration of, of uh, mini batch SED. And we can then apply default uh, composition to get the end-to-end -end privacy guarantee of, of the training process. So in a nutshell, instead of going from the privacy of the Gaussian mechanism, epsilon G delta G, and applying composition, we instead go through um, the privacy parameters of the subsample mechanism. And these privacy parameters are denoted by epsilon S delta S. And then we apply composition to get better privacy analysis for the DPSGD procedure. Um, on a high level, the merits of DPSGD are that it is a very generic recipe. It was applied to you know, computer vision and LP data sets successfully, and it was also being it is also being applied to ads modeling use cases. Uh, on the flip side, it can incur a large utility drop, especially in settings where the threat model that DP the DPSGD uh, caters to is an overkill and I'll touch on that more in the remaining part of the tutorial. And moreover, there is also usually an increased training um, time associated with DPSGD that I'll also discuss in, in the subsequent slides. Uh, one thing to mention is that DPSGD has 
some open source implementations in TensorFlow and PyTorch that are available and that are um, widely used in industry and in, uh, the academic research community. Um, there are also possible improvements for DPSGD that leverage um, gradient sparsity, which is very common in ads modeling data sets and more general and more generally in large embedding models. And also there is uh, a sizable uh, research um, body of but body of work that tries to get a better privacy accounting for DPSGD and that tries to achieve a higher utility for the same privacy uh, level. So now let me um, talk about the ads modeling use cases. By the way, for some reason, the part of the animation is hidden, but we will share the slides uh, on the tutorial website uh, just in case. Um, yeah, so one of the findings in uh, when we apply ads modeling, when we apply DPSGD to ads modeling use cases, has been that um, larger batch sizes help significantly in achieving a better utility. So in non-private training, there is usually a limit to how much increasing the batch size helps in improving the utility. Uh, that's not the case usually in um, DPSGD and that uh, going to very large batch sizes and like hundreds of thousands, sometimes in the millions can substantially improve utility. Uh, usually this is coupled by running the data, the training process for more epochs. Uh, and moreover, um, there is the clipping parameter that needs to be tuned. And it turns out to play a substantial role in improving utility in these ads modeling data sets. And typically, once one fixes the large batch size, clip tuning the clipping norm ends up playing a big role either in improving AUC or in improving some of the other utility metrics um, in ads modeling. Um, and uh, so concretely in some of the PCTR modeling data sets and one of the papers that I'm listing here, um, the utility achieved by DPSCD is 10 to 15% increase in the relative AUC loss. And this is for an epsilon between 0 0.5 and 10. And the compute needs increase by around 20% compared to non-private training. So it's a noticeable increase in the compute in the training uh, runtime, but it's not huge. Um, and um, so, so that's kind of the DPSGD uh, part. Uh, if there are any questions about this, uh, I'm happy to answer them now. Yeah. Um, what is the impact of the DPSGD um, method on the convergence rate of uh, optimization algorithm? I mean, if you inject those uh, DP approaches like um, gradient clipping or um, or random noise, can the can the optimization algorithm get the same convergence rate as it has before? Yeah, that's a great question, and th there is a lot of study on that question. So, for example, in different optimization settings, what is the rate of convergence for the PSGD compared to non-private training? And the answer is that there is an overhead. So the convergence rate does get slower for many of the problems. It depends on the specific assumptions you make uh, and the theoretical bounds, but there is a slowdown in the convergence rate. So it's both observed in theory and in practice. Um, yeah, uh, any other question about the previous part? Okay, I'll now move to the next part, which is about um, variant of DP that um, assumes that, the, where we assume that the adversary knows more about the training data set than what DPC, DPSGD typically assumes. And consequently, we try to achieve higher utility than what DPSGD achieves. Um, and specifically, one such setting is uh, so-called label DP. So to describe it, let me first just quickly recall 
what is the standard DP training setting or full DP training setting. So in that uh, setting, we the training algorithm um, aims to protect every single uh, training example, X, I, Y, I. And the substitution notion of DP was defined by, at, by, by changing a single training example, X, I, Y, I. Uh, by contrast, label DP will aim for a weaker guarantee, and as the name suggests, it will only aim to protect the label of every single training example. So, in other words, the adversary will be assumed to know all the features of every training example, and uh, when uh, we substitute um, some information to go from the data set X to the neighboring data set X prime, we are only substituting a single label. And that threat model ends up being realistic in several ads modeling use cases, where the ad tech already knows the features that are used in the modeling data set. For example, the ad tech on the publisher site might already know the impression, the ad that is displayed, what are the attributes of this ad, what is the product being advertised, what is the size of the ad. The ad tech might also know the user features on the publisher side, but the ad tech might not know whether the user converts on the advertiser side, which depends on cross-site behavior of the user that the ad tech on the publisher side does not have access to. And in those settings, uh, label privacy is the natural notion uh, that um, that it makes sense to enforce in, in such situ situations. Uh, that said, um, Label DP precedes any of the of the ad modeling use cases, and in fact, it was introduced more generically in a paper in 2011 um, beyond the ad modeling use cases. There, are, it's a very actively researched area, and there are multiple algorithms that have been proposed for training uh, machine learning models with label differential privacy. Um, I'll focus on a subset of these algorithms in this presentation, but um, there are more algorithms that have been uh, suggested in the literature and that go beyond uh, ads modeling. Um, one category of such label DP uh, algorithms uh, are so-called feature oblivious label DP uh, procedures. And in the setting, we assume that there is a labels uh, there is a party that holds all the labels in the data set. For example, it could be the advertiser that holds all the conversions in the data set. It sends some privatized labels to the features party, which could be an ad tech that is training the model. And then the features party who has access to the raw features and these privatized labels is supposed to train the model, which would then satisfy epsilon label DP. Uh, guarantee provided that the labels that are the, the label information that is sent from the labels party to the features party mm -hmm. satisfies epsilon DP with respect to these labels. And um, within this framework, one uh, recipe for training these models is to first apply some mechanism to randomize the labels y1 up to ym and get a uh, uh, randomized set of labels, y1 tilde up to ym tilde, and then run some standard training procedure, even a non-private training procedure on these labels, and minimize some empirical loss with respect to the noisy labels, which are the y tilde. Uh, for example, one can try using the Laplace mechanism or the randomized response mechanism on the yi's to get these uh, y tildes. Uh, more systematically, one can try to look for an epsilon DP mechanism M that minimizes some expected loss between the true labels, the YIs, and the noisy labels, which are the YI tildes. And here the expectation could be with respect to some uh, distribution of the labels Y and some um, choice of the mechanism M that randomizes the labels to get y, y tilde given one. Um, so a question here is how to get access to the distribution over the y's, because this is a distribution that depends on the training data set. In practice, one could 
try to estimate such a distribution by spending part of the privacy budget to uh, learn a prior of the labels Y. And given such a prior, one can then find the mechanism M by optimizing this expected uh, loss function. For classification tasks, the loss function could be the misclassification error, which is the indicator that Y tilde is different than Y. For regression tasks, it could be something like the mean squared error, for example. And um, this recipe uh, was applied in a couple of places in, in, in recent work for both classification and regression. And it has influenced some of the APIs that are deployed on Chrome and on Android, and that I'll uh, mention later in the, in the tutorial. So in the case of classification, one can, as I mentioned before, apply randomized response to flip every label with some probability and keep it the same with the remaining probability. But one could try to do something um, in addition to that using the recipe I mentioned in the previous slide. Specifically, one can try to first uh, compute some prior on the labels and then use that prior to improve the way we randomize every label. Um, and it turns out that um, one um, strategy that optimizes the objective function that I mentioned on the previous slide is um, so-called RR on the top K labels, uh, where top K is referring to the probabilities of these labels according to the prior distribution that was estimated in the first step. And it turns out this strategy is optimal for the objective of maximizing the agreement probability between the flipped label Y prime and the true label Y, given the prior P. So more precisely, uh, we can try to find an epsilon DP mechanism that minimizes this misclassification error. And it turns out this can be rewritten as a linear program where we try to find um, the best coefficients for this mechanism. And the coefficients here are the probabilities that we output a certain Y tilde when the input is a certain Y. And since... Um, these variables lie on the probability simplex. This gives rise to some equality and inequality constraints. And moreover, because we want the mechanism M to satisfy epsilon dp, this leads to additional inequality constraints. And this leads to a linear program that, that can be solved. And moreover, uh, in, in one of the papers, uh, we characterized the optimal solutions to this linear program to have this top K randomized response structure. Um, in the regression setting, an alternative characterization was obtained in terms of randomized response on bins. Specifically, uh, turns out the optimal solutions to, the, these, to this linear program when uh, the loss function is some regression loss function, for example, mean squared error, have the following special structure. We group every label and every like contiguous set of labels into some bins, assign some representative for every bin, and then apply randomized response on these representatives. Uh, and it turns out this um, uh, class of randomization mechanisms is optimal for a wide set of uh, regression objectives. In practice, we still need to find what are the bins and what are the representatives to use. And it turns out a linear program um, can be solved using dynamic programming in a, and, and this leads to an efficient solution that can be computed in practice. Um, I'll discuss this in a bit more detail later, but this led to flexible reports that are supported in the privacy sandbox Chrome and Android APIs for uh, ads measurement and modeling. So before I move to the next part, are there any questions about uh, the previous part? By the way, how much time? Okay. Um, okay, so before I um, move on and describe some additional randomization mechanisms, 
let me describe some evaluations uh, we did for uh, RR on bins. So one data set uh, that we evaluated on is from Criteo. So this is a sponsored search conversion log data set. It has around 15 million examples and it has 90 days of Criteo live traffic. And it is a, a data set where the task is about predicting conversion values. Um, specifically, uh, it's about predicting the conversion value amount in euros for a given impression. Uh, so we evaluated some of these uh, regression algorithms for training models with labeled differential privacy. And in these plots, we show the mean squared error on the vertical axis and the privacy budget on the horizontal axis. And we compare different types of label DP mechanisms. For example, the Laplace mechanism, the staircase mechanism, exponential mechanism, as well as RR on bins. And um, as these plots show, the RR on bins mechanism achieves a much smaller mean squared error on the test set compared to the other baselines. And um, the left plot here shows uh, the error in the labels, and the right side shows the generalization error uh, after machine after training the machine learning model and evaluating on a test set. Um, it turns out that the previous mechanism might is not optimal in all settings in the sense that even though it optimizes the label error and achieves the smallest error uh, among all randomization mechanisms that are epsilon DP, after training the model, it can still lead to suboptimal utility. And the reason is that model training cares about both bias and variance, whereas these mechanisms are only designed to minimize the variance. And it turns out that if we factor in unbiasedness into the objective function or into the constraints of the linear program, it can lead to alternative randomization mechanisms that could have a better performance in practice, even though these mechanisms will have larger variance than the RR on bins mechanism that I described in the previous slide. Um, with these unbiasedness constraints, the problem can still be formulated as a linear program, but uh, in this case, we don't know of explicit solutions to the linear program, and we don't know of efficiently computable solutions to the linear program. Um, so uh, here I'm showing what is this a linear program that has the unbiasedness uh, constraints included. Um, and um, we can still solve it using some generic LP solvers, but um, that takes uh, more time to solve compared to um, the cases where we don't have unbiasedness uh, constraints uh, in in the program. Um, and uh, one one interesting thing here is that even though the true labels in many of the ads modeling use cases are non-negative, um, when we include unbiasedness as a constraint, we end up having to output some negative values with some probability in order to achieve the unbiasedness uh, property. Um, on the theory side, having unbiasedness in the label ends up leading to some unbiasedness property in the gradients as well, uh, which um, can be used to show some convergence rates that are not um, necessarily um, uh, true in the case of RR on bins and other biased uh, algorithms. And in practice, um, we evaluated also the unbiased mechanism uh, in the same setting as the RR on bins mechanism was evaluated. And uh, turns out that it provides sometimes an order of magnitude smaller error on the generalization uh, side uh, compared to the RR on bins mechanism, uh, even though the error in the labels is higher. Um, one last thing I'll mention about label DP is that one can implement multi-stage training in, uh, in this context. So we can 
train the model repeatedly and use the prediction of the model in every iteration to compute the priors in the subsequent iteration. And um, we've, we were able to use that to improve uh, the accuracy in some of the uh, prediction tasks, particularly in computer vision. And it could be useful in uh, label TP training more generally and in ads modeling in particular. Um, okay, so next I will um, talk about some logistic regression um, algorithms. So for logistic regression, it turns out there is like some special label DP algorithm that can be implemented. And it leverages the fact that for the logistic loss, one can rewrite it as a linear function of the labels Y. So specifically for a given uh, features matrix X, uh, the gradient and the ends up depending on the labels Y through only a linear term X transpose Y. And as a consequence, if one only cares about label DP, one can train these um, uh, models, uh, these logistic regression models by just using a linear query um, that satisfies DP with respect to the labels Y. For example, one can use the discrete Laplace mechanism or the summary reports and the attribution reporting API that wasn't mentioned in the first part of the presentation to only compute a privatized um, function of the labels and then use that function to train a logistic regression model. And in fact, that strategy was used in a competition at, at KDD in 2021 to um, uh, solve some challenge by Criteo. And that solution was uh, implemented by Meta and ended up being the winning solution for uh, modeling um, in that, in that uh, contest. Uh, in practice, we've compared uh, label DP logistic regression to other approaches, such as using randomized response on the label and using some uh, deep neural networks for the modeling part. And in our experiments, it turns out that um, the latter approach is superior utility-wise uh, compared to logistic regression. But depending on the API, in some places, logistic regression might still be a desirable uh, solution. Okay, so uh, this concludes the label DP part of the presentation. The remaining part uh, talks about a, some threat model that is between full DP training and label DP training. So before I move to this uh, part, um, are there any other uh, questions about label DP? Okay. Uh, so actually, maybe I'll uh, say one more thing about label DP is that in the previous uh, slides, we've talked mostly about uh, the case where um, the adjacency relation is defined with respect to a single training example, either the label or the label and the features in that training example. But these um, guarantees can be naturally extended to the user level setting where um, what we aim to protect are a collection of examples pertaining to the same user. And this, um, in this setting, um, we can use the group privacy theorem to uh, provide guarantees uh, for user level uh, or user cross advertiser or user cross publisher uh, level. And we have a, a, some collection of experiments in this setting. So maybe I'll quickly I'll go over those before going to the last part of the presentation. So specifically, if in, in some cases, the goal is to protect uh, the user level privacy or user cross advertiser level privacy, the challenge is that a certain user might have multiple interactions uh, in a given time period. And um, we will need to divide the privacy budget across multiple examples in the training data set. In the case of um, label DP, we can divide the privacy budget on these examples. And for example, for randomized response, we can just flip every label in every example with a larger flip probability than we would have 
needed to if we were training with example level differential privacy. And um, there is here a choice in terms of which examples to retain if we are capping the contribution of every user to k examples. For example, uh, we can retain random impressions for a given user, or we can retain the first k impressions for a given user. Um, for users who have less than k impressions, we also have a choice in terms of whether to set the privacy budget to epsilon divided by the maximum number of impressions per user or set it to epsilon divided the, by the true number of impressions for that specific user. Um, and similar options exist if we are training with alternative privacy units, such as advertiser level privacy or publisher level privacy. Um, and we've uh, run some experiments on ads modeling with these coarser privacy units. And surprisingly, the utility remains quite decent, even when we shoot for the stronger privacy guarantees than impression level. So for example, for um, one of the data sets uh, that was a Criteo attribution modeling uh, data set that had around 6 million impressions and where the conversion rate is around 6%, uh, we looked at some deep learning network and um, that data set had like a very large skew in terms of the number of examples per user. So some, many users had a small number of examples, but there were some users that had a very large number of examples in the data set. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, when uh, we trained some of these models uh, with the label DP, the relative AUC loss was still less than 10% on a relative basis even for the user cross time privacy unit. And um, for impression level privacy, the UC loss was much smaller, uh, less than 1%, but it was um, encouraging that even for the coarser privacy units, the relative um, AUC loss is still uh, decent. Uh, we also ran some additional experiment on proprietary ads data sets when, where we could evaluate uh, more granular privacy units, such as advertiser and publisher level privacy units, where we cap the total number of examples per user advertiser or user publisher. And um, the findings were similar that um, even for user level privacy, uh, the AUC loss is less than 5% larger compared to non-private training. And for the intermediate privacy, models such as publisher or advertiser level, the utility is higher. For impression level privacy, the utility was around 1.5% uh, in this case. Um, so um, the upshot here is that um, coarser privacy units are possible. They come with a privacy utility trade-off, but um, depending on the use case and the target privacy guarantee, uh, they could be adopted if it is. Uh, desired. Um, there were some limitations in this evaluation for user level DP, and that we only focused on binary conversion models, and um, we didn't evaluate all the possible device loss functions that uh, could be evaluated. And moreover, we only looked at an offline training setting where we had a single reporting window. Um, so uh, one um, area for future work is to do more systematic evaluations for these user level uh, training models. Um, so uh, one additional thing to mention here is that um, these uh, label DP algorithms are closely related to the event level API in the privacy sandbox on Chrome and Android. So this API um, uh, performs attribution in the browser similar to the summary reports um, API that uh, Pazin described in the first part of the tutorial. And the conversion information and the attribution are discretized in the browser. A randomized response is applied to this discrete value that is obtained, and then the discrete value is sent to the report collector, which is the ad tech in this case. Um, in the case where uh, there is no metadata that is specified in the browser, 
uh, one can use this randomized response output to train PCVR models that predict whether an impression leads to a conversion or doesn't lead to a conversion. And the ML models in this case can be tra trained on the attack servers using these noisy outputs of the event level API. Uh, one can also set the metadata bit to be a more granular value, and this can allow the training of PCONVS model or p-value models that predict, um, for example, the number of the dollar amount for the conversion value for a given impression. Um, there are many research questions related to optimizing utility and um, um, on top of this event level API and how to design better randomization mechanisms um, for, for the for, for training with label DP. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the RR on bins mechanism and label DP led to flexible reports on uh, the Chrome and Android uh, um, event API extensions. And um, it's still an open question how to compute the unbiased mechanism in an efficient, ma efficient manner that can be deployed in a browser setting similar to Chrome or, or Android. Um, there are also more complex algorithms for label DP that are known in the literature beyond ad modeling, but it's an open question whether these can be used to improve uh, on the utility for a given privacy level and whether these can be deployed in an API uh, setting similar to the one on Chrome or on Android. Okay, so now I finally get to the last part of the presentation, uh, but please let me know if there are yeah, any questions about the previous part. For your label DP. Yes. Have you compared it um so when we apply randomized response to the labels uh, we can in fact train any machine learning model in this uh, part of the diagram. Uh, exactly, yes. So that's limited in that sense that um, we are randomizing first the labels and then we get noisy labels and we can apply any machine learning model on these noisy labels. But maybe the question you're getting at is that if we had a more centralized way of injecting the noise, this could be this could lead to superior utility than just noising the input and that's a very good question and in fact there are um, such algorithms that we've researched uh, and we have a paper at iClear last year that explores such methods where we apply something like dpsgd that i mentioned in the first uh, in the previous part of the tutorial but we somehow project to a subspace um, that depends on the features, which are known in the case of label DP. These methods improve on randomized response in some regime of parameters, uh, particularly the small epsilon high privacy regime, but it's not across the board. So there are still some regimes of parameter where this type of recipe is the best we are aware. Yeah, but it's a very important uh, area of, of research because these mechanisms in the event API are very cheap to deploy. They only require randomizing in the browser, which is like a very easy to implement. It's just some lines of code you implement in the browser. Whereas the central DP procedure involve either implementing some TEE or some MPC. And moreover, you want to train in a TEE or train in an MPC. So the research question is whether we can indeed get a lot of lift on the utility side that justifies building this infrastructure. Uh, any other questions about the level DP? Uh, my question, I did the clarification, but uh, if I have to correct it, uh, right now, basically some of these 
features that are used here uh, even in the label we see are can also hold some private information. Uh, so this basically doesn't uh, we still trust that someone who's running the machine learning is uh, basically trusted and not going to misuse the data. Is there anything still works like local differential privacy that should be already in the uh, randomization inside of the browser that is not being sent even to anyone who would not be then trusted? Therefore? Yeah, that's a great question. It's also a very subtle question because mm, in this diagram, it is true that the browser is sending the impression inf information along with the noisy labels. So maybe your question is, why are we sending the raw impression information to the ad tag? Why aren't we applying local, for example, local DP on the impression side features as well, which would allow us to claim a full DP guarantee and not only a labeled DP guarantee. And that goes back to the threat model. And the reason why this is, in a sense, not um, really a possible approach here is that the impression features, even though we send them as part of the report from the browser, in a sense, they are already known to the ad tech. So when the ad happens on the publisher side, in the way that you know, these the APIs are run today, the ad tech already knows that there is an app that was displayed to the user on that publisher website. They don't need the browser to know it. They don't need the API to know it. They know that we just showed an ad to user, you know, Alice on publisher New York Times. This is already known to the ad tech. They don't need to use ARA, like this API, to know it. What they can use API, the API for is to try to link it to a conversion side information. And that's why we're only protecting the linking of the to the conversion side information through randomized response. So, yeah, so it's a subtle threat model. We could definitely say the browser will send the impression information with local DP. That's like totally valid, uh, but it's in a sense pointless because they already have the impression side information. So it's not like a genuine, like a true improvement to the privacy of the of the features. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So, and this is actually related to the last part of the presentation, which touches more on settings where we can try to get a website to show an ad to the user, even without the, advertise, the, the website knowing that they sh just showed an ad to the user. But this is not how the internet has worked in the past 20 years. It requires some additional infrastructure that is built and it requires the browser playing a more prominent role where the browser shows the ad to the user without the website even knowing that an ad was shown to the user. And in those settings, uh, protecting the impression becomes more meaningful and more possible if, if, if we move the ad serving stack to, to such a design. Yeah, but that's a great question. Okay, any more question about this part before we move to the last part? Um, how much time do I have? Yeah. I think, okay, great. Okay, so the last part, um, don't see the title here, but it's about DP with partially known features. So as the name suggests, it's a setting where we're in a sense interpolating between the two previous models I described. First model was full DP training where all of the features and the label were considered as sensitive or unknown to the ad tech. The second model was a label DP where only the label was considered sensitive or unknown and all the features were considered known or non-sensitive. And this final model is really a middle ground where some of the features will be considered sensitive, some of the features are considered non-sensitive, and the label could or couldn't be sensitive. And it turns out this uh, threat model captures some advertising use cases similar to the ones we just discussed uh, in relation to the last question that was asked. Uh, specifically, um, there are settings where um, the trained model 
should be only differentially private with respect to, let's say, the labels and a specific subset of the features, whereas the other features are already known to the, ad to the adversary and need not be protected by the training procedure. For example, uh, some demographics, or age or user interests or browsing history of the user could be deemed as sensitive or unknown to the adversary and we can aim to protect those features. Whereas um, some features about the publisher website, like what website is this ad being displayed on? What is the browser class of the user? Is it a iOS user or an Android user? What type of device they have? What is the language on the publisher site? That type of information might already be known to the publisher just for them to be able to render the content on the user's device and in that sense there is no point trying to protect that since it's already being exfiltrated beyond the ads modeling use cases um, specifically uh, there is a particular use case where this um, dp with partially known features is particularly relevant it arises from the privacy sandbox protected audience api uh, which is being deployed on chrome and android and this API allows, for example, remarketing use cases where um, an ad tech can get to uh, serve ads to a user uh, depending on the behavior that user had on other websites. So by definition, this type of use cases in advertising are highly sensitive from a privacy standpoint because the ads shown to a user are dependent on the cross-site information or behavior of the user. So this is a setting where the ad is being rendered to the user in an isolated fashion. And there are proposals in the privacy sandbox to uh, render those ads in a so-called fenced frame where um, the publisher doesn't get to even know what ad was being shown to the user. Um, but this is still a narrow use case. Um, primarily targeted to remarketing use cases. And the question arises, how do you train these models where some of the features are only known to the browser? They depend on the browsing history of the user. Some other features are known to the ad tech. And the label you know, might not also be known to the ad tech because it might be a conversion label that is only known to the advertising website. So this uh, DP with partially known features captures this ads modeling setting. Uh, before I describe some algorithm in uh, this setting, is there any question about the threat model? Okay, so let me describe one possible way of training models that satisfies this um, DP with partially known features notion. Um, one thing you can do is to combine the two categories of models that I described in the previous part of the tutorial. You have a bunch of features that are not sensitive, and you have a bunch of features that are sensitive. You can start by tossing away all the sensitive features, or like zero out their embeddings. And you can train a model using label DP, where you only privatize the label. Anyway, all the remaining features are non-sensitive, so you can train that phase. You can use part of your privacy budget, let's say epsilon one, for the label DP phase. You can follow it by a second phase where you now treat all the features as being sensitive, and you use the remaining part of the privacy budget, which in this case is epsilon two delta, on the second phase. Now you can apply composition for DP and put together these two phases will be epsilon one plus epsilon two delta DP. So here, two baselines are to one is to just to you know run the first phase alone, the label DP phase, with while ablating all the non all the sensitive features and using the full privacy budget on that phase. The second possible baseline is to run only DP SGD and ignore the fact that you have a subset of features that are non-sensitive and just treat all the features as sensitive and use the full privacy budget on that phase. 
And it turns out that this hybrid DP algorithm that has two phases and splits the privacy budget between the two phases, and that really caters to this DP with partially known features setting, turns out it provides higher utility for the same uh, epsilon parameter compared to these two baselines. So we have some evaluations here on the same criteria PCTR data set, as well as the criteria conversion data set. And you can see the three curves. The orange curve is the one that applies the DPSGD baseline using the full privacy budget. The blue curve is the one that applies randomized response, which is a specific label DP algorithm, while tossing away all of the sensitive features and not trying to model based on them. And the green curve is the hybrid DP algorithm, which is this two-phase privacy budget splitting procedure that I described in the previous slide. You can see for the same epsilon value, the utility is much higher for um, the hybrid DP curve or the relative AUC loss increase compared to the non-private baseline is much smaller, especially when epsilon is larger than three. Um, and similarly, uh, we ran a similar user, uh, user level DP evaluation in the setting where the privacy unit is more of a user level privacy unit rather than an example level privacy unit. And in this setting as well, uh, the hybrid DP algorithm achieves a much smaller error compared to the full DPSGD or full randomized response based on this. Um, any question uh, about this part? Okay, uh, one last uh, twist to the threat model that I will mention is that there are some further settings in ads modeling where the threat model can get even slightly more intricate. So instead of assuming that for every example, the ad tech knows or the adversary knows some features but doesn't know the remaining features, there is a third type of knowledge that the adversary can have. Specifically, the adversary might know the set of all values that a feature belongs to. So instead of having every feature being just a float 32 um, value, the adversary might know that you know these 10 features taken together, they belong to a very specific table. And that, for example, corresponds to all the ad creatives that can be shown to users. So in practice, that could be a much smaller set than just saying these 20 features are all possible float 32 values. And it could be used to improve you the utility compared to the setting where we don't have that side knowledge. Um, so this is a stronger privacy notion than assuming that the ad tech knows these features on a per example basis. Uh, because here we only assume that they know the values of these features, but they don't know the specific realization of every feature. But um, in some settings, it is the more appropriate uh, side knowledge that is known to the attack. And there is some recent work in the literature that designs algorithms for this DP with a known set of feature values uh, notion. Okay, so finally, let me conclude with some practical insights uh, from the different uh, work that we surveyed in this area. So one take home is that DPSGD is feasible even for tasks that have a lot of sparsity, whether it is a sparsity in the labels or a sparsity in the gradients themselves. And um, this is enabled by a combination of advances and compilation methods that allowed scaling to very large batch sizes and tighter privacy accounting, as well as more tailored algorithms. Moreover, tailoring the algorithm to the specific threat model in advertising, for example, the label DP threat model or the DP with partially known features model can allow higher utility without compromising privacy in a noticeable way, since oftentimes the ad tech or the adversary already has access to the information 
that that is assumed to be known by these more relaxed threat models. And um, prior information on the labels can be used to improve the utility. And this prior information can come either from historical data that is available to attacks, or it could come from current model predictions, or it could come from splitting the privacy budget and, and using part of it to build these prior uh, this prior information. And finally, known features can improve uh, utility in ads modeling use cases. Some research directions um, include uh, designing better algorithms for ads modeling for these different threat models, the full DP setting, the label DP setting, as well as the DP with partially known features setting. On the label DP side, one a uh, concrete question is to obtain a full characterization of the optimal unbiased randomizers, um, as well as better algorithms for computing these optimal unbiased randomizers so that they can be possibly deployed in a browser setting. And um, finally, one additional uh, algorithmic question is to design procedures that um, work well in this setting where we have partially known features as well as features with a partially, as well as features with a known set of values. Um, to conclude uh, the tutorial, um, many of the DP primitives that uh, Patton and I described are open sourced, and there is a lot of DP libraries that have been um, open sourced in the area from OpenDP to IBM to Google. And there are in particular DPML libraries that are open sourced and um, that can be used quite easily, including TensorFlow and PyTorch. Moreover, the different privacy and measurement and modeling APIs that Pazan and I described are being discussed uh, in many uh, public forums as part of the W3C for example, the PATCG forum, which stands for Private Ad Technology Community Group, they are being discussed, you know, with active feedback from ad tech uh, and different browsers, as well as some academics. So if anyone is interested, it's uh, quite easy to sign up to some of these mailing groups and join the next meetings, which take place on a regular cadence. Uh, same uh, also holds for Project Halo and that um, the, there are discussions taking place under the supervision of the World Federation of Advertiser, and the code for the project is being developed on GitHub on the open source. To conclude, a uh, final take home is that formal privacy guarantees for ad analytics and modeling are possible, and differential privacy offers one generic tool that was developed for more, more general use cases and that can be instantiated for ads modeling and analytics use cases. Uh, there is a lot of room for designing better algorithms that can push to the privacy utility curve and well-defined functionalities and utility metrics are uh, invaluable for pushing the, the, the status quo and, and, uh, and improving on the state of the art. In terms of uh, general uh, future directions, one area where there has been very little progress so far is to obtain general purpose DP synthetic data uh, procedures, particularly for ads modeling use cases. Uh, there has been very little research on that problem so far, but uh, if methods like this are available, they could be of, um, substantial use possibly in the ads context. Uh, another also general um, direction that comes up in a variety of ads modeling and analytic settings is how to combine known data uh, with data that is deemed sensitive or unknown and that is output from the privacy preserving API. What is a general and a flexible way in which um, we can combine this known method, this known data with the output of, uh, of privacy-preserving methods. 
uh, such um, a recipe could be very valuable in my field. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming and let us know if you have any additional questions. Yeah, please. Uh, no, non features, uh, DT. Uh, so what, regarding the uh, adversary model, there basically just protecting now the advertiser. I'm usually advocating for protecting the user, but uh, if it's completely dependent on what is happening in the browser, then uh, basically the browser can say to uh, data and do very much what the user specified to do. So, would it run in some trusted uh, execution environment? Or what are other like concrete proposals how to address this uh, adversary model? Okay, that's a very interesting question. So you're saying that in some of these proposals, it seems like the browser um, could um, report wrong information about the features, for example, and that could hurt the utility of um, downstream tasks, for example, the utility for advertisers. And that's quite inherent in most of these proposals, if not all of them, from all of the browsers, and that you have to, one has to somehow trust uh, the browser there. Otherwise, in a sense, all bets are off. Now, this can be mitigated by the fact that many browsers are open source. For example, Chrome is open source. Like You can um, at least inspect the code and see that it's properly implemented. But that's also, I can build my own version. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a tricky problem. Uh, TEEs, in principle, in principle, you know, one could try to hope for some uh, verification uh, there as part of the TEE. If, like, for example, the attribution is done in a TEE, or the modeling is done in a TEE, but that comes with a trade-off usually because now you'll have to push more function, more complex functionality to the TEE, which has some you know, infrastructure costs, some, yeah. And you'll also have to trust the cloud provider. They are not cheating and TEs have their own sets of problems in terms of the side channels and, and whatnot. But to answer your question, yes, it's like a very valid question. I don't think there is like a very, you know, strong set of solutions that have been developed, but it would be very interesting to, to research. Yeah. Like trust the browsers? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think if they want to use the APIs in the current shape or form, I think they have to be trusting that the browsers is operating as intended. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, if you like to go back to your slides. Sure. Okay. Yeah, let me know yeah, when I stop. A little bit, uh, Maybe uh, I can just. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, what, why, why, why here you're saying the uh, arm bias randomization uh, is important? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, because it's like they, they don't have time to for this kind of Yes, so pretty much it's, I'll show you one plot and it summarizes why we think it is important. So there are use cases and some data sets where when we evaluated the unbiased mechanism, in fact, multiple data sets, it gave much higher utility than the any of the existing randomization mechanisms that are implemented in the browser or you know proposed for the browser. So let me just show you that. Plot. Yes, so this is the one. So if you see this plot, this is evaluating the unbiased mechanism with several other baselines. So the, um, the optimal unbiased mechanism is uh, represented in brown. The RR on bins, which is in a sense the best known biased mechanism, is in purple. And then there are other, um, you know, 
mechanisms that are you know, either unbiased. In this case, they can be made unbiased. This is the Laplace and the staircase mechanism. They are in blue and in, 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 in green and, uh, and in orange. So here, if you see the, un the RR on bins provides improvements compared to the other ones. The scale is quite distorted. There is like orders of magnitude apart on the on the on the vertical axis but the take home is that the brown curve is much better than several of the alternatives and that's why that's the gist of the reason why we think it's valuable to try to achieve you know the utility of the brown curve is there any uh, reason or any fairness for the equation to find like why unbiasedness matters compared to to like having a biased training procedure yeah so it seems in general like there is a you know uh, bias variance trade-off in training these models in principle um if you have a biased procedure where the label flipping can introduce some bias you don't have very strong guarantees in terms of conversions because the gradient descent procedure will have bias in every step of, of the way, every step of, of, uh, of the training. Whereas in the bi unbiased mechanism uh, case, one can prove some conversions bound that are stronger than what is possible for, um, for the biased mechanisms. Yeah. yeah, but it's mostly an empirical question in many of these cases because, yeah, it could also be that there is a sweet spot between bias and variance where we try to balance the two by changing the objective so that we have a sweeter spot. It is to add to the answer, I think like in the in theory, you can use a oh yeah, so other people also here. Yeah, just to add to the answer a little bit, I think if you have a bias in the randomization, uh, when you take the number of samples to infinity, uh, you're not guaranteed to converge to the optimum. But if you don't have a bias and you take the number of samples to infinity, you will converge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that may be another uh, yeah. explanation. I mean, it's the same, but just rephrase. Yeah. Yes. You also said why there is a healthy problem that you can Oh. Great point, yes. Um, it can be solved. We can use like a generic LP solver, but it's not efficient in the sense that it, for typical settings, for example, you know, some of these evaluation data sets, um, the value, the label is in euros or dollars. So the range is quite large. Like it could be items that cost 50 cents to items that cost 10,000 euros so the range is quite large and if you have an lp that is you know quadratic and that many values it will take a long time to to run so it is solvable in polynomial time but in practice when we try to run it for some concrete instances it is too slow to be run in a browser setting yeah so Oh, yes, yes. Like once we have, yeah, like once we go beyond labels and we try to apply it to you know, like a few features and we're trying to extend the same procedure to protect a few features, yes, things blow up exponentially in the number of features and that becomes unusable. Uh, yeah, following uh, his question, uh, uh, Mr. consumption would be uh, or the memory or the computer consumption will be uh, if you use like multi dimension, not, not very high dimensions, which curve would probably be. If we try to write down this LP in a way that is um, that applies to multiple dimensions, I think, for example, to give you a sense for uh, RR on bins, which was uh, the biased mechanism for which we can solve it using dynamic programming. The runtime was proportional to k times d squared, where k is the number of labels. If you are in a setting where you have a few features that you are considering as sensitive, 
and each of these features takes a set of values. So let's say it takes 10 values and you have uh, T of these features. Then you have 10 to the T, many possible labels for all of these features and combination. So instead of K, you will have like 10 to the T possibilities. So it blows up exponentially in terms of the number of features. Yeah, so that's why I think these procedures will work best uh, only in the label DB setting. Uh, the other paper I alluded to um, that uh, does projections, um, it, th there is like some recent work in the literature that I can point you to uh, offline that does better than this exponential uh, blow up. Yeah, but that's uh, it's a different algorithm. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, if not, uh, I guess we can end here. Thank you again. And uh, please feel free to follow up offline if anything else comes up.